Greetings and welcome to this week's episode of John and Roman Solve the World's Problems. That is a lie. Uh, with me, as always, of course, is my co-host and partner on this venture, John, the creative blue collar guy. And we have a great panel this week, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion because it's probably going to get a little weird. So we have Matt, Unbearable73. Welcome. It's good to see you again. Uh, we got Stephen Ransom with us, Brandon, Cheers. the anime guy, and Mark Darren of Pinhead Games. Welcome all. How is everybody doing this Thursday? Hey, uh, awkward. That's how they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the heat wave uh, finally broke in Jersey, so at least until tomorrow. So it's a little better. Fair today. enough. That's and that's all mm -hmm. we can hope for. Although I am working in the of the Empire Studios, which is a balmy ninety four degrees, and yes, it is horrible. So uh, we'll start off this week as we usually do, and this is the section I'm now calling "Things People Want." And just a quick look here at Eric July and the Ripaverse. Uh, now at $3.4 million and 43 days to go. So he is still still has movement uh, in the Ripaverse. And it's not, it, granted, it's not fast anymore. I mean, he rose really quick and then he's kind of kind of leveled out, but he's still making sales, still making money. And that is good to see. What is that? I, I am completely. So you're not even. Oh, okay. So uh, Eric July, he's a YouTube creator. He is a musician, entrepreneur. Works for the Blaze or with the Blaze. I don't. They really works for the Blaze. Um, and he was sick of all the woke bullshit in comics, and he decided to create his own universe. He spent two hundred thousand of his own dollars, and set this venture up. Uh, this isn't a GoFundMe or anything like that. All, all the other money that I'm in has literally been on the Ripaverse site. So yeah, independent, fun, like like it, it, it is structured like a GoFundMe or whatever, but it's independent of GoFundMe, so they can't like you know cancel culture or whatever. Although um, uh, PayPal has tried holding up 1.2 million of his dollars. Are they uh, holding that up? They. Last I heard, yes, because uh, he he's been fighting with them and fighting with them. PayPal is no longer uh, an acceptable pay method on his site. Though, if you order through PayPal, you're still getting your product. He's like, yeah, you ordered it, you're getting it. Uh, hopefully, yeah, his sort of, lawyers were going to work it out. There was some sort of loophole or something that I read that they claimed like. Um, if it's either a new account or a bunch of people that are brand new to PayPal are paying, or if it's a new campaign, there is lots of different, if it's this, this, or this, um, they could withhold the funds for up to a certain amount of days. Yeah. Uh, but they've extended whatever the, the whatever the reason like is. As to days, why, and then they extended it out to like 90 days. Yeah. But it's like, whatever the reason is for why they're actually holding it, um, uh, they're going to hold it as long as they possibly can. Um, uh, it's yeah. debatable as to why, but I think we all know why. <laughs> damn, damn, damn right, we know why. <laughs> he legally speaking, since he is uh, rectifying the error with his own cash, he. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just saying how I know. I've been told this from my own lawsuits uh, that since he's rectifying with his own cash and they're not paying up, not only are they going to owe him interest, but there's going to be a huge penalty tax on top of it for the mm. damage out of his own pocket. Oh, good. Hmm. Yeah, I he hope, needs to take PayPal to the cleaners. They're com oh, yeah. they're complete and total woke lunatics, and they can uh, uh, they can uh, as Cartman would say, uh, lick my balls. So yeah. <laughs> and I know Roger lick guys, the and, ball. Uh, you know, any of us are rich, but people who can afford to sue people like YouTube or whatever need to do it. That's why they don't mess with Jeremy from the quartering. He's established; he will sue you. You know what I mean? Uh, Tim Pool's established; I will sue you. Uh, Crowder's established; I will sue you. And they don't mess with them anymore. So same with Project Veritas. Died, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They'll all yep. sue and they should. Yeah. Oh yeah. So let that be a lesson. Don't screw with anybody in their uh, their income stream because uh it, it can get ugly quick. And we we don't want ugly, we want awesome. No ugly, okay. we want awesome. Just and to toss a little opposite. bit of uh oh, go ahead, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Roman. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was gonna move, I was gonna move, but stay 
finish finish yeah, the thought I, out with this. Thing. I don't want to take up too much time because in this early part of the stream. I know that this is basically just a newsletter <laughs> that we're going to run through some topics that are current events, but um, you know, in the future, this is a message to like all of these big major companies. Uh, if if they're concerned about the uh, safety of ordering from a private venture, then they should be offering up some sort of a certification before they allow their payment platform to be utilized. Uh, because uh, everybody knows that you can pre-order for all of these small companies uh, introducing new video games. This has been going on for decades now. And uh, you know, for them to claim that uh, the Ripperverse is something so new that they can't feel comfortable <laughs> with the existence of it, then they should offer up some sort of a certification plan. Yeah. Um, they shouldn't just block him outright just because of concern for their customer. Here's a customer willingly putting cash on the barrel head. They should allow for some certification process, not play the song and dance with their legal loopholes. Yeah, and especially yeah, when he's ponying up points, man. Especially when he was ponying up so much of his own money to get it started. Exactly. He said this wasn't this wasn't a crowdfunding effort. It was more just kind of like pre-orders and pre-sales. Yeah, traditional pre-order. But, um, but he he had it fully funded when he started it. So the fact that they're saying that this isn't legitimate, it's like he he had like he had the money. He was doing the thing. But yeah, they did now, it because they could. It's you know. <laughs> Are you happy to ask the question now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I can't stand PayPal. They drive me crazy. Moving on. Moving yes. on. Yeah. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. It is. I can do that it now. I'm so opinion. happy. <laughs> yes, you can. Right, so, yeah. so good. You missed me so, doing roll in, roll like in, roll in, <laughs> like the rawhide whip. <laughs> so uh, now things that we don't want. We'll try to we'll try to plow through this pretty quick. Um, the I'm sure will be incredibly successful Ironheart, um, <laughs> and 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 now Matt, you you're like you know this is better than the comic book armor, and it's it honestly it's I would yes, but better than the comic book armor is still a pretty low bar for a product yeah. that. I think as many as seven people are excited about, but I wouldn't say it's probably more than that. So we have the armor. We've got young Riri Williams uh, in the, you know, the mock-up stuff that they do when they're shooting. Um, and the villain of this is the hood. One of the lesser known Marvel villains. And that's probably not without reason. Well, of course he's a white villain. That's why they're using him. <gasps> Stop. You. And we've been canceled. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's been a good show. Good night. Appreciate you all coming this week. <laughs> See you next week. So, <laughs> Iron Man literally has like one of the larger villains galleries in Marvel. And they like, pick literally. the effing yeah. hood. Again, yeah. it is actually a Marvel villain. That's true. Yeah. He's just like, you want to talk tiers of villain. He's uh, maybe an F or G level villain. <laughs> maybe. I, uh, never, I know that there's, I know there's the Red Hood in DC. But I have never heard of the hood <laughs> in Marvel. So. He's not, so it's a it's a shit villain for a shit show. They couldn't villain. get a better villain lined up. So um, I'm not going to go down this whole list. Speaking of things that people oh, don't Lord. want, it's Shrek. No, I'm sorry, it's She-Hulk, and they actually have and they're they're they they must know this show is bad because they're really trying to there she is lady shrek she's oh, lovely sweet chocolate <laughs> of course, that's an Mark insult Ruffalo, to shrek um <laughs> looking dull and confused even in real life it's really not much of a representation they're bringing back the wong um everybody loves wong <laughs> Oh, I thought you uh, said the schlong. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. When, hey, oh, when, when was there a character so called the schlong? So no, that's uh, only Tim when Roth. Flaccid is on the show. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'll have to have him next time so that the long joke goes better. <laughs> uh, Tim Roth as Emil Blonsky, the abomination who was in... <sighs> Pardon me. Uh, the uh, Ed Norton version of the Hulk. And I actually also an abomination. Like, I like I Ed would Norton disagree there on that one. But... I hear he's... He's, he's very difficult movie. to work with, which is why he yeah. ended up getting uh, brought in. Um, 
he let's, he see, let's see what we have actually in the chat right before I, I go on too long because I tend to do that because that's my way. Uh, we got Lord. Zach's Dragon Ruse, uh, good old Jacob Ironside, a troubled green. Um, and I think that's where we are right now. And so, thank you everybody for showing up this evening, we do appreciate it. Um, and now back to the rogues villain here of Emil uh, Blonsky and Charlie Cox. So this is where they're going to assassinate Daredevil. Um, I loved Charlie Cox as Daredevil. I thought he was great on Netflix, uh, seasons one and two, and even three, which I was still pretty happy with. Um, he had his little cameo in Spider-Man No Way Home. And now they are going to throw him into She-Hulk and damn them, damn them to hell. And then it goes down after that. We just start getting into kind of randos and that no one gives a shit about. So we're not going to talk about the rest of those. Yeah. But I thought it was all interesting, it just kind of the the big, the, you know, the big names that they are throwing yeah. at this. All I will, all I will say is, uh, all, all that I will say is they can go <laughs> themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what? I'm, well, looking I'm looking forward to watching these shows. Oh God! I like a little. You're a brave man. Thing. Yeah, I mean, you're... Uh, they're not. They're not okay. They're not shows that I'm looking forward to per se. They're not like things that are on my list that I gotta see. But I, I kind of dig the the experimentation that they're doing in the in the in the lull of what Marvel has going on. Oh, I don't Let's, know. They, it's like they just keep digging the hole, though, man. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're digging a hole. There, it, it's like when you when you start dealing with negative numbers and trying to figure out how to get out of the hole. Yeah, they they can't seem to understand that when you're already negative, you can't uh, you can't keep uh, putting more negatives into it because it just puts you further into the hole instead of getting you out. But uh, oh, they did put out a minute of the show. And of course, uh, the first thing that they're showing is her driving and getting in a wreck. So reinforcing the stereotype that women are, <laughs> wait for it, <laughs> drivers. <laughs> no, I couldn't help it. They, they, they brought it upon themselves. That's all I'm going to say. And we got, yeah. uh, we got Max Von Priestley in the house. Good evening. Max. MVP. Hey, oh. And Good I got a woke you. victory for you. What the wokest have have made a victory over their own cause, because with all the cancellations at Warner, with all those woke mm. movies being canceled, the one of the legitimate like non woke like black characters that's original and people tend to love or like Static Shock, his TV show got canceled in the middle of all that. Oh, I didn't even oh, know man. he was going to have a, another show. I actually. Uh, I, I remember the cartoon, of course. I didn't know they were going to be yeah. doing a live action. Yeah, they were, they were developing live action. It was looking oh, like it was going to be well done, and it and it got canceled in the slate of well of of the woke cancellations. That is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, it's our friend Ezra Miller, uh, who apparently filmed Flash <laughs> while he was evading the authorities. <laughs> so. I'm sure there's there are no legal problems with this. Can, at can we all. just call him Roman Polanski Jr. now? <laughs> so <laughs> maybe he's a legit, fella, illegitimate child of Roman Polanski. So you got mm, that going on, possible. but it's but wait, there's more. Um, as as they say, um, this is from Rolling Stone, the the liberal Rolling Stone. Um, oh, fucking Rolling Stone. Now involves Vermont <laughs> Child Services Department because he, he may be harboring on his farm. Um, a, a woman and uh, a 25 year old mom and her three children who the state is looking to remove from custody of said mom. Oh, that's fine. And so he's, he's hitting all the right wickets. He's doing fine. You know, he's out there. He's in the business. Oh, he's, he's out hopefully there. Hopefully going to jail. <laughs> So he's, a, he's, a, he's another liberal white guy keeping minorities on his plantation. <laughs> There's another... Man. That he is a day then, and because of that, he is untouchable. I'm sorry, you cannot touch him. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, thankfully, we can't. <laughs> 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 the only problem is that could have caused I could have short circuited the whole thing here, dude. We just got this shit working. <laughs> so, the whole okay. table over. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> 
there's so an right interesting short legal precedent that's uh, that's that's coming up through all of this. I mean, what is the responsibility and the ethical and legal ramifications of Warner Brothers? Yeah, not right. just turning this guy in, like completely throwing their hands up in the air and saying we will not work with a child terrorist. A, uh, Where is this movie being shot? Where is I, it being shot at? I, you know what? Actually. International law covers some of this stuff. I mean, okay, you so can't is transport a person across international lines that is legally in in question. Well, it would be state line issues. The question, my main question is, where are these reshoots happening? What studio or what location is has he supposedly been at when all of this was going down? Well, he could be filming it on blue screen at his farm. I mean, that is totally possible. <laughs> Um, clear. I mean, this all these media reports. I, I mean, I know he. I think he likely did all this stuff, but I don't want to jump the gun just because the media is reporting that someone is in trouble with the law. Until we see an actual arrest warrant and a bench warrant from the judge, yeah, that's true. You know, let's just not. It's all alleged. Not, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. I love the pager that he has on his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's going back in time. Uh. Anyway, so that's that is the run through on some of the quick news items of the week, and now we're actually going to get into the meat of the show. This is our our favorite movies for the decades of the two thousands, the twenty tens, and the twenty twenties, and I think you'll see weird. a a pretty grand slide as the decades move on. So I'm going to hit my list here. And I have... Now, I included the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, and I know that's cheating a little bit, but... No, um, no you have to. It's, 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 it's a film. It, to me, it's a movie. Do yeah. I have a favorite of the trilogy? Yes, and that would be The Two Towers. <coughs> yes. The Lord yeah, of the, the Rings is one book. Is, is a, is, right. is, 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 it's a It's a thing. So uh, then for me, and oh, I'm sorry, I actually had more pictures, but I'm dumb and I forget that I do things. <laughs> it's okay. Remember, He's sorry. this is, I actually have technology that works now, so I'm still thrown by it. Um, so now it's just all operator error. Now it's, now it's just me fucking up. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love this movie. I, I saw it probably a thousand times. Mm. It came out in 2006, mm. and we got an illegal. I think it was Norwegian copy on cruise. So it had these <laughs> fucked up subtitles, um, but they were still fun to read while we were watching the movie. This movie just had so many, oops. I, and then see, see what happened there. I, I pulled Man, a Roman. You're just going um, off the rails I here. Know, like, I know. My computer Stop works. I can click on things. <laughs> and then I just keep clicking and then it just all goes to hell. Um, you know, it, it, it just is what it is, you know. <laughs> so for my <laughs> awesome movie, <laughs> um, this was I think Zack Schneider at his best. I like so Watchmen good. a lot too, but I loved the Three Hundred. Um, yeah. Gerard Butler was just perfect as Leonidas. I liked the weird filming. There was just nothing I didn't like about it. But I'm not going to dwell. I'm not going to dwell. Um, now on to a bit darker one. No Country for Old Men. This was, it's a strange movie. Um, it's kind of just about the end of morality is the basic plot. And how do you deal with that? And it's this scene with the coin, <laughs> the coin uh, flip is one of my favorite scenes ever. Don't, no, don't put it back in your pocket. Like it's just some regular coin, which it is. And then Tommy Lee Jones. And of course, um, is, is just superior in this movie. Um, then Iron Man. Iron Man was the one that, that this was such a game changer for superhero movies. Um, and you know, especially for Marvel, who really hadn't done fuck all. Uh, Iron Man changed the whole thing for them. If it if if you had cast someone else other than Robert Downey Jr., the movie doesn't necessarily work. If you have a different director, the movie doesn't necessarily work. There are a lot of things that had to come together for this to work. And it worked so well uh, that it started the entire Infinity War saga, which was one of the, the great epics of filmmaking. 
uh, with the exception yeah. of Captain Marvel, which was complete shit. <laughs> and then the count. last one I'm going to throw in here is going to be probably debatable. Uh, I, I love this, but not everyone will. John will hate it. You're wrong. It's Inglorious <laughs> Bastards. Yeah. Inglorious yeah. Bastards for me was a lot of fun. Uh, I liked all the Apache. Um, Eli Roth is the bear Jew. And Christopher, uh, or Christoph Waltz as... Uh, I forget the, the 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 Germans, the Nazi's name, the Nazi hunter or the, the Jew hunter. Um, but he was just very compelling. And the girl, um, Soshana, there were just a lot of elements in this movie. That I, the ending was a surprise the first time you see it, uh, the alternate history ending. But, you know, I, I didn't mind so much. I, I was OK with it. It was funny. I was just laughing my ass off when it happened. Uh, so those were those were my my top five of the two thousands. So let's, let's just go around the horn and we'll start with Matt. Okay. So I actually struggle with this list. Cause I couldn't get it below six films. I just couldn't because I was I t- trying to knock things off of this. And I was like, because there's so many examples of, of the best of their genre in some respects. Well, anyway, I'll get to it. So the best movie of the decade is the best war movie of all time. And like any Ridley Scott film, if you can watch the extended version, you always want to watch the extended version. It's Black Hawk Down. I, I, I watch it every year. Uh, if you want to know why certain political positions are wrong, watch that movie. Okay. Um, now, after that, uh, the best horror movie of this century so far, it's called The Shrine. Now, I have to very mildly spoiler it to prevent you from getting big spoilers. The <laughs> people who make Blu-rays are morons. The director of this film, it, it takes place in Poland. Uh, the setup is uh, a woman just disappears in this town in Poland, and her and her boyfriend and someone else go to investigate why. Okay, They all speak English, and the people in the town only speak Polish. And the director of the film did not put subtitles on purpose so it would increase the sort of tension. So when the Polish person might speak broken English, like like go away or you know something like that, you're, you're supposed to get that foreigner in a strange environment type of set, you know. But then the morons who did Blu-ray put subtitles for everything in, and ruined the film because the Polish people say outright what's going on. Like, you <laughs> oh no, <laughs> yeah. So if you watch this film, it's a horror film. And it's like the usual suspects. I can't tell you very much about it without oh, ruining it. That sounds but interesting. It's a, great, it's a great horror film. When I watched it, I was amazed. Someone told me, Matt, you'll love this. And I, said, and I was like amazed how good it was. And I watched it every year or so. It's one of those films that like seminal to the horror genre. Right? I, I missed the title. What was it again? The Shrine. S-H-R-I-N-E. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, came out in 2008, if I recall. Now, the next film... This is to me is the best dystopian film of all time. Um, if honestly, the director of this, ha- he's one of those directors who needs a strong producer to rein him in a little bit and tell. Him, but it's called Equilibrium. You, I, you guys have heard yes. of it. Yes, yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, yeah. good um, choice. There, you know, and like he instead of filming the scenes that would have fixed some of the problems, he said that he just I'll tell him about it in the director's cut. You know, and that's. So there's explanation for parts of the film that don't make sense in the director's cut. When, and everyone said, uh, buddy, you should just film those te- five seconds of fill it footage. You know? But anyway, so I'll move on. Uh, we talked about this before. The Lord of the Rings is one book, so it's one movie. Um, I'm, and I refer to the theatrical editions of the Rings that the flaws that tend to make me downvote the films show up way more in the extended editions, especially for The Return of the King. And the Fellowship of the Ring, not so much the Two Towers, because the extensions there show more of the war. Which one of my bigger, honest criticisms of Peter Jackson's movies are he doesn't show enough of the war going on that was shown in the books. But anyway, actually, I move on. Now we get to the best werewolf film of all time, starring Sean Pertwee, who we talked about before, and uh, Kevin McKidd. And these two actors should get more play. It's called Dog Soldiers. It's a somewhat different take on werewolf movies. I've um, seen this. I yeah, forgot about I, this. Yeah, everyone should go watch it. It's 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 dark. It has dark humor to it. Um, but it's a little bit of a different take on the standard werewolf werewolf film, right? And my last one's another horror movie, and it's the best dark fairy tale movie of all time. Even my mother, who doesn't watch horror films, says, "Matt, 
this is damn good. <laughs> you know, my mother doesn't watch anything made past 1990 to give you an idea. Mm. You know, she only started watching 90 Star Trek films like four years ago. You know, so anyway, uh, this film is called Darkness Falls. If oh, I you haven't watch, seen it. I've, I know it exists, but I've never yeah. seen it. If you see, um, so you know how a lot of fairy tales are Disneyfied and seem very nice? This is basically about the tooth fairy. And but it's about the actual tooth fairy, you know, like you know what I mean. Not not the Disneyfied tooth fairy yeah. that looks like Tinkerbell, you know. And it's 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 borderline an amazing film. Uh, I wish it had gotten more play. So that's those are my. I couldn't get it below that. I I, I fought hard. I just couldn't get below those six. <laughs> no, and it, you know, it, it it is a struggle. It's it's so. Um, I'd forgotten about this movie. Uh, and Dragon if you haven't Bruce figured Bruce. out yet, I like horror movies. <laughs> like, I would never yeah. have gotten that from any of your input there, Matt. Those were <laughs> those were those were those were weird. I like it because I'm I'm digging the weird. I'd forgotten about this King Arthur movie. It was the Clive Owen version. And it was a very yeah. different take on King Arthur. It was, yeah, the, the yeah. Romans there and was all a, that stuff. I thought it was interesting. A movie called Centurion that came out of yeah. I think you say there were a couple of them. There was the Roman Eagle Arthur and then the Centurion, and, and they came out around the same time. Yeah. So if you can see the Centurion, that's a very good movie about uh, relatively accurate, except for the magic stuff, to um, the Roman experience in northern uh, in England slash Scotland. And it's uh, it's interesting. So my 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 son Jake of the Empire and I just restarted watching uh, the HBO series Rome, uh, oh, which God, I think yeah. is just one of, the, one of the greatest. One yeah. of the greatest. We we just so, talked about Kevin Kidd. So here you go. Oh, I know. I, I literally I, him yeah. and. Um, uh, fuck, Ray, oh, the guy the well, guy. um, yeah, uh, oh, what was his name? Okay, I, I wish those Stevenson, two actors, Ray Stevenson, great. yeah, they're great. Those two guys are great together, yeah, they were perfect yeah. in that. So good. All right, so we're gonna jump over to John, the blue collar guy, for your picks of the 2000s. And just right there, when you said your son, I thought you were about to crack another joke about not the, you, asshole. Meet up. <laughs> Uh, and actually, before we move on, though, I wanted to real quick when you you pulled up Iron Man as one of your your picks and how he said if someone else had played Tony Stark or someone else had directed it, I actually remember reading that I think John Favreau really went to bat to cast Robert Downey Jr. Yes, uh, they wanted Tom Cruise. He, he well, not only that, but he was Robert Downey Jr. was still kind of coming off of some of his legal troubles and rehab and this and that and the other, and yeah. um. He, he cleaned up and got his act together and John Favreau like really went to bat for him and the studio was like, ooh, we think he's a little bit of a risk. I don't know. And like, and I, just like you and probably everyone else here, I can't imagine another person playing that character, especially in that first movie that was supposed to launch that whole franchise. Right. Um, but a lot of that is all due to John Favreau saying, you know what, like, just trust me on this one, give him a chance. Yep. And if that movie had failed, like we probably wouldn't. No, you have wouldn't had, have had the rest. That you wouldn't. You would not have had, had any of those. Or uh, you would yeah. not it have had an ambassador. Yeah, which the way things are going now, it might have been a oh, good yeah. thing, but we would have missed out on the first eleven years of good films. <laughs> no, and that was quite. That was plenty, and I think we we've had this discussion. <clears throat> they should have ended it after Endgame and just given it all a rest. But yeah. greed destroys everything. Yes. So uh, for the 2000s, which is actually kind of funny, in my, my 2000s list, uh, kind of like Matt, I had to whittle it down. I actually got it down to six, but I'll just like rapid fire them really quick. 2010 was okay. 2020, there's a little bit of fluff in there. I had to kind of bullshit a little bit. Uh, <laughs> we all for the 2000s, and some of these might be kind of unpopular. I don't know, but I'm just going to go for it. First one, Donnie Darko. That was good. Yeah. Um, that's that was kind of one that's of those a mind weird, trip. That's one of those weird movies that people either they've seen it and they love it, or they've seen it and they think it's overrated or it's stupid, or they've just never heard of it. But I I think I think it's a great movie. I think it has great rewatchability. Uh, that's another one where like if you watch the the director's commentary, you get more weird insight into what's going on. Um, the next one, I uh, went with more of a comedy. So here, here's kind of the thing is I think last week I played it a little bit more safe where I was trying to be very, uh, oh, like big, epic, whatever. And then yeah, that's I, my I, son. I, I forget who I forget who in the panel brought it up, but somebody brought up Monty Python 
And at that point, I was a little bit embarrassed that I didn't oh, think yeah, of that. Was, yeah, that was, I, yeah, I think it was Mark that brought that one up. If I'm not I absolutely saying. love no? Monty was Python. It, it, someone, I'm, forgive me, I'm old. That was I'm me. Old. Who was it? Who? It was the Holy oh, Grail. Brandon. <laughs> Brandon, okay. Brandon, yes. So, I mean, any anything Monty Python, but especially the Holy Grail. Like, as soon as that came up, I was like, oh, I'm a moron that I didn't think of that. Because I wasn't thinking comedies at the time. I was just like, I don't know. Maybe I was, I was thinking too much of it. So, this next one... Uh, little bit of maybe a lesser known film by the guy by the name of uh, Mike Judge Idiocracy amazing yeah. movie <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we're living in it <laughs> if anyone here has seen the movie Idiocracy oh, in California it has, you are it, it, it has become <laughs> eerily true and accurate and we we are living in the times of Idiocracy <laughs> interesting uh, the next uh, technically, well, the next one, but the next two, both are. I, I had I had to go with some Nolan movies. Obviously, we talk a lot about Christopher Nolan. If you guys tuned into the live stream on Monday, we talked about Memento. Uh, actually, I take it back. The next three are Nolan movies. Um, the Dark Knight, that was the one that introduced Heath Ledger as the Joker, um, which again is maybe you know people loved it or hated it because they didn't like what Nolan was doing with the Batman universe. But I don't think anyone here could deny that Heath Ledger gave a terrific performance as the Joker in that movie. Oh, so yeah. it was just a great film in that, just playing what the Joker, Christ. just his his performance. Um, the Prestige, another Christopher Nolan movie, Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, the two magicians, mm -hmm. uh, which Roman I believe still has not seen. I still haven't seen it. No, no, no. I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's pretty, pretty messed uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Prestige, uh, Memento. We talked all about that on Monday. I don't need to say a lot about that, but Memento is a great one. And then this one, I wasn't going to include it because I was trying to keep it down to five, but it popped into my brain and I thought it was worth mentioning. Uh, but maybe a little bit of a lesser known movie called The Soloist featuring Robert Downey Jr. and Jamie yeah. Foxx. Uh, where yeah. Jamie Foxx was like a homeless uh, cello player, a classically trained musician, and Robert Downey Jr. was this like journalist, writer, guy that discovered him. Um, lesser known movie, I don't think it got a ton of attention, but just fantastic direct, just the way it was directed, filmed, shot, acting, story, everything. Just uh, I had, I felt like I had to squeeze that one in as an honorable mention. Was the soloist. I haven't Most seen excellent. that either. That's a solid that's, list. That's a good one. That was that one was kind of obscure. I think it came out like after Iron Man, so he was already kind of getting into the Marvel universe, but it just sort of like flew below the radar a little bit. But definitely worth checking out. Cool. So Max is asking, do you do you believe that Iron Man could be the best of the MCU films? Ooh, and uh, I you still he no still hasn't seen Top Gun. Oh my God, uh, <laughs> Mother of wait, God! Wait, who hasn't man. seen Top Gun? It's because he hates you, Navy guys. I know, effing Marines, man. Um, so, and I, I go eat I your crayons, that, Max. Uh, Iron Man is is the most important of the yeah. Marvel films, but and I and I say in the chat, my 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 personal favorite, and I'll bring this up in the next round. Uh, we'll get to that one, but uh, I think it's the most important one. Without, I guess we've just talked about it. Without Iron Man, you don't get the rest of it. Right, so. and that's in in its in, in its entirety: the <laughs> cast, the production values, <laughs> right. the storyline, the directing. There was that film had no foundation of MCU lore whatsoever beyond the comic books. It was its own thing. It came out of nowhere and surprised everybody. My normie brother loves that movie. And he's not into yeah, comic books. He's not into sci-fi. That's good. Robert Downey Jr. had a lot of appeal. He's very charismatic on the screen. Yep. He's an actual with Gwyneth Paltrow, who's a fucking weirdo in real life, but is really good. Oh, in the she's movie. the worst. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and oh, and fucking uh, Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges, um, the dude, is so good in this. Yep, uh, Obadiah yeah. Stain. What a fucking you know. It's a great awful name. He, he Everybody so brought the really entertaining. They kept that movie very grounded, which is a huge element in, in bringing people in, where it wasn't fantastical off the bat. They, they weren't dealing with nanotech suits that just appear out of nowhere. Everything no. was tactile. I, everything was grounded. 
everything helped pull somebody in and make it relatable. And that was yeah. no, you're a hundred percent on yeah. that because it got so weird at the end. Uh, by the time you hit <laughs> end game, yeah, he's got his magical fucking armor, which just kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's not as fun. And I get it. It it became it became um, a convenient plot device for it to be able to do that. But as far as um, the real armor was still uh, to me was just better. Yeah. Uh, what what do I know though? Nothing. I'm just a silly guy working in an overheated garage. <laughs> <laughs> so we got Salty Texas here as well. It's good to see you, Salty, my brother. And so let's jump over now to Stephen Ransom. Okay. Um, at, like Matt, this is an impossible task. I mean, even for to whittle it down to per decade. <laughs> so what I decided to do was to put it, in my opinion, um, the, this is a list of my top five for technical achievement between 2000 and 2009. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty diverse. I'm going to admit that up front. So uh, first one off the list is an animated feature called Metropolis. Mm. Um, this is a continuation. Me, do, you, do you have those clips to share, uh, Stephen? Um, if you or check you the, to, uh, try I tweeted out. I tweeted out the YouTube on Twitter. So there's me, YouTube, me, me, YouTube uh, uh, shorts there is, for each. I would say as high as a 45% chance that I am not going to cock this up. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Pretty well, good. Computer, like, pretty good. Computer is, is holding you back this, this I'm going to go out and buy a lot no, of now it's just, Now it's just me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it may be easier to just uh, search a, search an image so that at least people can um, see a, a vision of uh, what we're talking about here. Okay, um, let's um, here. Here, I've got it. If you'll share my screen, yeah. I've got it for you. Okay. There we go. Let me and you could scrub the... through this, Brandon. There we go. You could definitely scrub through some of the earlier parts just so that people get an idea. And is this is this based on this that, is based the, the, on the film uh, that, that came out so many many years ago? And th it's the original is like 1927 or 29. Right. It's but um, yeah. the, uh, the Japanese author of the series uh, is has actually been working on this universe of his uh, since the uh, 60s at least. And um, oh, sorry, yeah. there are several universes combined into this universe that were all part of his manga uh, universe. Well, that explains the look of it because it, it has an Astro Boy 60s feel to it. Yep. Yeah, oh, they, they, to they kept yeah. it very much in the vein. But uh, the reason why this gets on the list for technical achievement is that this is one of the earliest uh, adaptations of CGI composited with uh, 2D animation. And it is a miraculous tour de force of what they were able to achieve in animation with this feature. I mean, you could see by these screenshots that it is just a visual feast mm -hmm. for the eyes. Uh, it's a political drama. It's about social unrest. It's about political corruption and, and corporate corruption. And about one man trying to basically turn the world upside down so he could take it over. And this all happened before 9-11, this film was developed. So... Uh, there's even a ziggurat that collapses at the end of the film, which is really what brings it to my heart every single time. But moving on, uh, the next one on my list uh, for technical achievement is uh, Speed Racer. And I will I will fight anybody down a dark alley forever over the worthiness of this film uh, to be on this list. I absolutely adore the clunkiness and the seriousness of this movie. Uh, I just can't sorry, get over. Sorry, I, got, I got a commercial first here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful adaptation. Yeah, it is a I genuine never, adaptation. Exactly. I don't love the movie, but I love what they did with it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is yeah. 2D come to life. It really yeah. is. 
the the art style definitely fits in and this is back before uh, uh the uh the wachowskis uh lost their touch yes i agree i agree but that that sequence in that in that video the, the clip that i chose <laughs> sorry about that and it, just like that <laughs> we know what you were looking at there we go <laughs> it brings chills to me every single time i see that final race i i mean i've watched this movie Whoa. dozens of times since i since yeah, i sorry. I've brought it home. sorry about that it's it's goddamn salty story <laughs> about that <laughs> Okay, next one on the list. It's funny because it's animated. Hang on. Is is YouTube okay? My other computer is kind of freaking out. I'm Here, go ahead and bring mine up. Kind of I've got the next up one on ready. YouTube. Oh, no, 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 no. What are you doing? No. <laughs> YouTube is going fine. I mean, you it's, it's, son yeah. of a bitch. See, it's my other computer now. My other computer is pissed. I do what did I not talk nicely to you? It's jealous. Cliff. You pick up another oh, boy. No, you piece of crap. You dropped off my. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Frassen, Rassen, Frassen, no, Frassen, Rassen, Santa. Love it. Uh, I'll say, I, I, I think, is it uh, likes to drop my Wi-Fi and then I've got the next video ready. Live. Oh my! Yeah, God. I've got the next video ready for Stephen. If you want to go ahead and bring mine on, I'll play it for you. Yeah, I will. Thank you, Brandon. This mm -hmm. goddamn ape machine over here. Oops, where's my cursor? I'm like a 90 year old man. <laughs> right got to move I've the right lost, mouse. I've, I've lost my mouse. What happened to my mouse? Please fight. There we go. Okay. Okay. So this next one, um, the reason why it's on this list for, for achievement is it also, like Speed Racer, takes the European comic book nice. industry and brings it to live action in the same way that the movie Snatch brings oh live God, action. I just that again. So those quick cuts and cartoonish uh, takes that happen in some of the crime dramas we watch these days are all in this movie. I mean, almost every single shot is basically playing on the visual animation. Uh, you could see by this clip that it is visually almost cartoonish in it, in the way it presents these issues. And she is quite literally a modern uh, Audrey Hepburn, beyond shadow yeah. of a doubt. Uh, she is just the most adorable creature ever uh, I think I've seen on film. I uh, just can't get over her at all. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. It's fantastic. one that I've meant to see. I, I've never seen it yet, but it's on my list to see. So I'm Oh, my God. It. Sit <laughs> all the females down in your household, man, and watch that movie with them, and they will thank you for well, it. I'm it honest. <laughs> Such an enchanting piece of film and very, very well, French. Okay, next one have, on the list. Let me let me say hi to Nosferatu the vampire real fast. Nice to have you in the chat there, Nos. Good to see you. <laughs> yes, hello, chat. And then Roman, you need to send a headshot to Salty. I know I gotta so Salty <laughs> is the master of the deep fake. And so that way we have the the Roman technical difficulties swearing cartoon. That'll be fantastic. I, I did a very like sad attempt at, at deep faking him onto Al from uh, Quantum Leap when he was like constantly like punching Ziggy, but it was it was short and it was kind of it didn't really work that well. But <laughs> I'm curious to see what was what salty could come up with. Yeah, if you'll share oh, screen again, I've got video clip for this one for oh. you. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Okay, All next right. one on the list oh, is a film. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Ah. And the clip that I've chosen, which you should definitely scrub through because there's quite a lot of information on this, basically shows some of the techniques they used to put Brad Pitt onto multiple characters moving through time backwards. Now, this would have been impossible before this feature. As a matter of fact, this one almost broke its own budget trying to achieve this goal. They used capture technology. They used the state of the art of visual techniques in 3D mapping and 3D syncing to make him grow younger over the course of the film. On top of that, uh, with the screenplay by the same, same person who brought us uh, Forrest Gump, this film travels backwards through the 20th century through his eyes and gives us this uh, historical uh, record 
uh, of a background character, basically uh, traveling through the 20th century. It's it's really a fascinating uh, capture of his life and a capture of his romance with probably one of the most beautiful women in cinema these days, uh, and that's uh, Kate Blanchett. Can't go on with Kate Blanchett. And last one, I'm not going to do Two Towers. I decided to swap that out because I knew there would be plenty of coverage on it. <laughs> um, uh, that was a technical achievement for Gollum. But I think I'm going to go with uh, my uh, another entry called Let the Right One In. Oh, yeah. What an oh, awesome. That's a good one. And uh, this hmm. is a horror film from Europe. Uh, I believe it's Swedish. Yes, uh, it's in Swedish language. And it is probably one of the most fascinating depictions of vampire lore, I think, that's been brought to the modern cinema. Um, there was an attempt at a remake that was a total ridiculous <laughs> waste of time for everybody. That was not good. I've seen it. I can tell you it was that bad. was not good. But some of the things that they yeah. bring into here about the mind of a young serial killer, um, the mind of a young vampire, what it's like to be immortal, um, what it's like to be a vampire, even, um, mm -hmm. are all played into this with the background of a very disturbing post-communist Europe uh, or a coming to post-communist Europe. So the two, during 2008 the was the right. No, that's not it. Yeah, it was. No, uh, it's 2008. 2008 was let the right one in. Uh, yeah, but the story part. takes place in the eighties. Yeah, it's a Cold War story. Yes, that it's a Cold War story. Talking very about sad. interesting, like very well done, like very sad type well done. You know? yeah. yeah, and uh, a precursor to the Swedish onslaught uh, from uh, 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 the, the 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 dragon tattoo girl or the girl with the dragon tattoo. Yeah, that's how this goes. Is this the right one? Looks like it. It's a magnet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they totally blew with the adapt the English adaptation on this one. Yeah, once again, there was just no need for it, really. Yeah. But could there's the audio a, dub this. There's a sequence in here where she asks permission because we know vampire lore, but he doesn't right. believe it yet where she asks permission to come into his house and he doesn't grant it. And we get to see a depiction quite visually on screen of what happens to a vampire when they don't get permission. And it is chilling, romantic, um, horrifying, tragic. It's so amazing to see it commence on screen, especially between these two very young, very talented and very believable actors. Wow. Hey, I've, and I, that's I my saw top the five. remake, and I wish I hadn't seen that. Um, well, there was, there's a tendency when directors do films like this to make them creepy, if you know what I mean. But yeah. they, avoid, they avoided that with this. Like, this was a legit friendship between someone stuck as a child and a child and in a horror movie circumstance. You know? Yeah, where, where the horror elements almost become a background to the actual themes of the story, which yeah. is what's, what cinema should be doing all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And that's my oh, list, guys. Wow. Great. Children of Men wow. was it, it they, that that was an incredible film based on an incredible book. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, people aren't having children anymore. Um, yeah. The last generation is called the Omegas. They've basically gone wild because they know that there is nothing left. They are un, they are uncontrollable. Um. And then a pregnant girl turns up, and then that's the whole story is yeah. about that. It's 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 the 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 film adaptation is very different from the book, but the the film really hits all the points that you need to get across uh, for 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 the film, and it's it's definitely worth your time. Please please check it out. So now Brandon, the anime what? guy. All right. Well, I want to preface this a little bit. The 2000s is when I was in my 20s. And I lived in the cinemas for that whole decade. 
every summer I would uh, I would drive to my uh, closest good theater, which at the time was an hour away, to go see these movies. And every single one of these on here, they're they're not the artsy, they're not the it's it's very straightforward American Hollywood cinema that encapsulates for me the 2000s perfectly now i'm going to share this window now i've i've the way that i ordered my photos was my best to the fifth with my honorable mentions and i don't feel like reversing them so we're just going to start at the very top so if you'll <laughs> share my if you'll share the screen okay oh there we go the lord of the rings now i myself have never read the books I know of them, and I know that there is a ton of stuff that is not in these movies. But when you consider how long the books are to start with, and how much of it Peter Jackson did get into it, and not only was able to get into it, but did it with love and care and respect mm -hmm. for Tolkien, this is a instant classic, and it is a series that I have watched again and again. I own the original DVD extended edition releases, and I will not watch this movie, these sets of movies, any other way. And I do count The Lord of the Rings as one whole movie. So starting with The Fellowship of the Ring, to my favorite, The Two Towers. Oh, The Two Towers is... The Two Towers is know, so it, good. Mm -hmm. I am still, to this day mortified and pissed at the academy for not giving the first two movies the amount of accolades that the third one did and i know why they did it because they're a-holes that way <laughs> but this one this is the movie this encapsulates all of the horrors of war all of the trials tribulations starting off in the light-hearted mood to where they go down to the depths of despair and then they have the return of the man who can do it gandalf the white who takes the place of saruman who should have been what gandalf became and then of course the return of the king battle sequences in it are great spectacular story is decent but it it doesn't hold the same the same chutzpah let's say as the second movie the second movie is the best of the three yeah, I'll fight anybody yeah. on that all day, every day, until the day I die. And this is a movie set that I will watch yearly. And I am eventually going to get the 4K versions of them. And whatever that Hobbit thing is, if it happens to come with it, sure, I'll just use them as coasters. But that's, you know, a side story. <laughs> um, if, if you find there are fan edits of The Hobbit that make mm -hmm. it very watchable. Well, good. I was I was hoping to do something like that. Yeah, the, the yeah third, I, I, I hate it. What they've done to it. Turned all three movies down to one, and it's a lot. It's mm. a lot easier to take. Oh, it. good. Well, because I do love the original Rankin and Bass. Of it that, that I yeah. think is the best version you'll get of it. Yeah. So yes, uh, Rankin Bass. Yeah, the Rankin Bass yeah, yeah. Uh, Hobbit is still one of my favorites uh, from from when I was a kid. We've been so talking about three. doing a stream about that one. Yeah. Oh, now, that's that. These are all good ideas. Yeah, these are all good ideas. Now, when we when we talk about blockbusters and new tech and go, going back to the to the adage, can you believe uh, you it? You need a moderator. Mo, mo, uh. We got uh, what do we got going on? Oh yeah, no, I keep getting bot attacks. Oh, yeah, bots. stupid we're, we're bots! Them. We got them. But yeah, well, like, when your when yeah. your channel gets bots, it's like, wow, you've arrived. My channel is yeah, exactly. Bots. Yeah, that's how I feel. I feel like I've arrived. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so you got you people here to nuke them. X Y Z sex bot yet? That's the guy. When you get that guy, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so the the next movie, while it holds a set of importance that's above and beyond all other things, it's not the granddaddy of superhero films, but it is this generation's father to speak. You believed that Christopher Reeves could fly. Well, I believe in Spider-Man. This movie, I remember, shattered everything that summer that it came out. 
trying to get tickets to this for the opening weekend was nigh impossible. And mm -hmm. as a show of technology, was one of the first movies that you could actually go to Fandango and pre-purchase your tickets for. Although the site was terrible and it crashed, I did buy tickets. I saw it opening weekend and it changed. It really did change my whole attitude towards Marvel in general. But the first Spider-Man movie and the second Spider-Man movie, I consider as one and they are classics. I would put them either separately or together up against any other film done prior to the MCU and under the current yeah. MCU. And they, as far as their storytelling, the believability, it's there. Mm -hmm. I love Spider-Man. They're great Sam movies. Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi did yep. such yep. a good job with the first two. Yeah. Yes. Yep. But the first two. Yeah, Sam Raimi knew, knew what he was doing and he pushed it. So moving on to the next round when we when we talk about you know the 90s we talked about cgi and cgi movies well the show as much as i love what pixar did the shows that really made them more for adults was shrek and the original yeah. shrek was a lot of fun taking the whole concept of fairy tales and turning already. them on their head <laughs> yeah i i love shrek he, you know uh, People either love or hate Mike Myers. I think he did a phenomenal job yeah, with great. this, and the supporting cast was great. The tech <laughs> behind it was spectacular, considering that this okay. was the first one, <laughs> the first time that DreamWorks really dipped their toes into CGI, because before that they were doing 2D stuff, and they were doing great stuff with it. But this was the first time that somebody other than Pixar produced a quality movie and made a crap ton of money. Yeah, Captain this, this, this was a juggernaut when it came out. I mean, yes, it was my, many a person's daughter and son and child like watch this thing until the DVD just shattered in the in the player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was a visual. It, I, I don't know if you can if that anybody can remember how quickly the audience lost its concept that this was a CG movie. Mm -hmm. And just oh, yeah. fell in love with the characters as beings on screen. I mean, that's an yep. achievement all by itself. Oh, yes, it was. And of course, the blooper reel, it never gets old seeing what happens when you code something just a little bit wrong and it yep. all goes to hell in a handbasket. Yep. And yep. with this, I have to include the second movie because the second movie was just as good. And in some cases, it was better, not only from the technical aspect, but from the story aspect. I consider yep. them once again as one. They are great. Two of the best. Two of, they're two of my favorites. And they're the only two that I that I bought the, the nicer DVD box sets for. So two of my favorites. And I count them as one. Now uh, this next puss, one. Go ahead. Hmm? Go ahead. Uh, Puss in Boots uh, coughing up that fur ball has got to be the most hysterical <laughs> piece of cinema ever. I just... Holy crap, man. I couldn't stop laughing for an hour. I was just laughing continuously. Hysterical. Man, that's, that's just that nasty. <laughs> so good. Yes, it was. And if you went to Universal at the time, they had the Shrek 4D ride, and that was a lot of fun. I, I went to I went to Orlando twice in the 2000s. And by far, even back then, Universal was a much better, much better place to go to than than with the exception of at that time, the MGM studios, when it was still the MGM studios at Disney, that was fun, but now it's something else and it sucks. Now, normally coming by Max, we appreciate yep. you. See you Max. In. Now you're jumping over to jumping over to Zach's side. Better Max. Now this next movie, I am not a Quentin Tarantino person. I have not seen any other works except for kill bill. I freaking Excellent. love Kill Bill and Kill Bill Volume 2. They are a masterpiece in storytelling, a masterpiece with Uma Thurman. Just all around, it oozes the charisma. It oozes that cheesiness that Quentin Tarantino is known for and turns it into a violence fest that is just... It is... It's very anime esque, and of course there is the anime sequence when t when dealing with uh, oh crap, 
I can oh, the, see the, her now, but I can't remember her the, name. Uh, they're remember. the magic eight balls. The oh, what the hell were they called? The crazy eighty eights. The crazy the Lucy That's Lou. Right. I knew there was a yes, name Lucy involved. Lou's character. I'm just happy I recalled that. Lu- Lucy Lou is a goddess. <laughs> yes, one of my. That's, was this this is one of my favorite last films. Couple of movies. Did he do anything? What was that? This? Was he? Were these David Carradine's last couple of movies? Yes, they were some of his last yeah, before, before his he. Uh, unfortunate. Well, he's departure. He did a lot of um, B movies, so there's a, quite a few out there. They're actually pretty decent to watch because he has a lot of on screen charisma. But um, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a lovely bookend and almost a tribute considering his kung fu yeah. legend series. So mm-hmm. yeah, yes, absolutely. So this this in my mind is a must own of Quentin Tarantino's work. If you don't like his other works, you will like this one. This is the most unlike the rest of them. The, the storytelling, you know, that still has the the chapter story uh, aspects to it that he likes to do with his others, but I think this is way better. It, it's to me, it's great. Now, Daryl Hannah. <laughs> it was just just some unlikely casting in here. It was just really yes. it was really clever stuff. Um, I and I always like to see um, Michael Madsen, and he you know you don't you, you don't see him anymore because he's now ancient. But at the time, he was he was a really good guy. You know, of course, coming off of Reservoir Dogs and the ear scene, um, but I I still loved him in this era. Absolutely. Now, for the next one, it's a toss-up between three of them from the same studio. And that studio is Pixar. So for my honorable mentions, I have Wally and Up. They told uh, more of a story with less actual speaking parts than mm-hmm. most any other film could ever hope to do. But yes. as excellent as they are and as technologically superior as they were ratatouille (laughs) is my absolute favorite pixar movie i put it up right up there with the toy stories and the reason is i love to cook and i've gotten pretty Uh. decent at it and this is a very (laughs) interesting look at the life of someone who works in a michelin starred restaurant see roman you should agree with this I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna make it a mission here. I've literally never seen this movie. Oh my god, <laughs> what? Roman. Watch it. It's a I good movie. You gotta watch it. This is it, a great just, movie. Just that clip of uh ego admitting that he <laughs> loved the food. That clip alone to me makes this film legendary because did I, they mean, get to, I yes. lo- did they get to eat the rat? Is he does he part of the no. thing? No. Oh, stop guessing. Just watch oh, no. the movie Christmas Just, stockings. And Peter Sorry. O'Toole Roman, is perfect as ego. What? Yep. Roman, you, you like to cook, you you like to be in the kitchen, you're a chef. Are you, you're are you saying watch. I'm a rat? Is that what you're saying now? Is that what you're comparing? Yeah, to? maybe a little no. bit. But watch <laughs> no. watch this movie. Watch this movie and then watch the prestige. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I watched Rat so, yes. just last week. I need I need a better video movie. clip for when you say shit like that. I gotta I gotta pull something out. What do you That's got? Excellent top five, Brandon. Yeah, so all of these are ones that I yeah, these are all ones that I saw in the theater, some of them multiple times, and I yeah. bought either the uncut versions of them, the director's extended, or just bought it straight out on DVD. I own every single one of those. Yeah, there was so. a time, and, and and this was all the way up till about like 2012, 2015 for me. If I saw it in the theater and liked it at all, I bought the disc. I mean, just without yeah. even thinking yep. about it. I added way. it to my collection. Yep. I'm actually getting Said, back to buying physical media. Um, I was just buying things digitally for a while. But the impending collapse of the grid and the end of the world as we know it, I started getting physical media again in the hopes that some way I'm going to be able to produce enough electricity to keep my Blu-ray player going. Get a few. I might get that. I might get that freaking rat from Rat Tattooie and put him on a wheel (laughs) so that he can uh, generate electricity for me. That's funny. Have a few spare players just in case, because you know lasers and mechanical parts of it do like to die. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, I think I have three three Blu-ray players at this point. I, I got one. I got Just like 17 laptops now, but I got one. F- <laughs> so, all right, Mark, Darren, you are up, sir. 
All right, I'll, I'll go through mine pretty quick. We're we're. Uh, I'm hoping I can make it to the end of this. Oh, I think we should go another hour. So oh, we yeah. got plenty well, of time. I, we're we're only in the 2000s still. We haven't made it out of the goddamn decade. Yeah, I know. So that's why I'm going to go through real quick. We are terrible and at plus, this. Plus, most Nerds. of my stuff has already been talked about, save for, for a couple of, uh, of titles. Uh, the, the first three are ones that have been on everybody else's list. It's uh, The Dark Knight. Uh, I thought Heath Ledger just brought, brought the movie to a new level, and we had a completely unexpected performance. From this guy who I only knew from like romantic comedies and was yeah, not yeah. expecting this to come out like mm -hmm. that, and it was fantastic. Oh, he made he made the freaking movie. He absolutely did. He definitely did. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, then there's Iron Man, which we talked about earlier. I, I loved the way that that kicked it off. I loved how grounded that movie was. It, it kept it in a, in a reality that was familiar to people, and basically is the thing that led you into the fantasy of of the Marvel universe. In a, in a in a wonderful natural way, Lord of the Rings trilogy, again, everybody's list, fantastic set of movies. You got to count all of them. Uh, I agree with you guys. Two Towers is the best of the bunch. I love that. Um, they're up there. So the, my last two are the ones that are the outliers, but I still oh. think are fantastic movies. Oh brother, where art thou? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen yep. that movie. I, oh my god, that now that offends it's called me. movies Roman has never seen. <laughs> exactly. Roman, you are canceled from your own channel. You still haven't seen the Road Star. Warrior, asshole. Get the fuck out of here. You haven't seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou or The Prestige. Uh, technical note him. on um, on on uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is yeah. it's one of the first achievements in color grading, modern color grading, anyway. Really. Yes, it is. Huh. Um, they, that's how they got that sepia, almost retro uh, kind of feel uh, to the film. Yeah, was through color grading all of their uh, their um, their on screen or their their on set shootings, huh. and they were pretty huh. laxed about it. All they did was just make sure the saturations were available to the image, so that they could do whatever the hell they wanted with it. But that was an early achievement in color grading. That's cool. I had no idea about that. I you could definitely see movie. it, but I didn't know that was like one of the, the first to kind of delve into that and, and and use color grading in that way. That's cool. But other than that, it's a fantastic movie. A lot of fun, a, a cool retelling of uh, uh, what is it, the Odyssey? Yeah. 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 I was going to say to Roman yeah. that it's, it's based on no, an ancient no, Greek poem. Seen the fucking yeah. thing. <laughs> so you should be familiar with it since you only just recently read all of your Greek poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it takes me a while to catch up on things, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody was fantastic in that. I really liked uh, uh, John Goodman's appearance in that. It's like yes. the Cyclops was such a cool oh, John Goodman. reimagining of that. Uh, and then my final movie on my list is uh, Casino Royale. Mm. Oh, fantastic. I accept this. Yeah. I absolutely accept this. Not everybody likes the Daniel Craig Bond years. I think Casino Royale is that's in my top two of the Bond yeah. movies of all time. Yeah, I'd agree on that one. I wouldn't say top two, but it's a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> Casino Royale was <laughs> actually really good. Yep. 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 Zach's I, I, it was a good out. time to uh to reimagine Bond back. To his classic days, it had gotten so. Have silly. a good show there, Zax. Thank you for stopping by for the, the Zax pre-show. We do Thanks appreciate for hanging it. out. Hey, <laughs> but yeah, Bond had gotten so silly and ridiculous in prior to the Daniel Craig. Regardless of what you think of the run of the I series, I stopped watching it. I yeah, stopped it, watching it, it after ridiculous. the Roger. Well, I wa I watched those first two terrible um, Timothy Dalton films, and I know some people like those. I'm not one of those people. And then yeah. I didn't watch any of the other ones. I didn't. I just didn't watch them during the Pierce Brosnan years because I just didn't give a shit anymore. And then when the Daniel Craig years were coming back, I understood he was a bigger fan of the older style of things and yeah. kind of that other. And I, I liked it. I think I think Casino Royale is a fucking great movie. Yeah, I love it. They they did a fantastic version of that. And again, it was it was that groundedness that I keep coming back to in cinema where it, it feels like it's in a real world. It feels like it's in a place <laughs> that you live and it's not invisible cars on jet skis on the ice <laughs> and shit like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've not been 
on the i5 recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but I love there's it. another I love thing it. too is it's that it, it solidified an almost nowhere time where it felt like it was the 60s, 70s. Yeah. But it was still modern day, but it had that feel and of a the 1960s time. spy spy yeah. drama. Yep. It was all just a man in a suit just fighting evil. It was mm. so good. Classic Bond. Yeah. Yeah, you know I'm, I'm kind of let down by uh, the the most recent version. Oh, uh, I was I was let they, down by they, the sequel. It was just so disappointing. Well, actually, I like Quantum Assault. This could actually this is this is a, uh, this is another discussion where we could talk about the Bond, <laughs> the Daniel Craig Bond era. Um, I like Quantum of Solace as a direct sequel, which was the only time they ever really had done that. Yeah, and the elements of the story are all very good. Um, I think you, it, it, I think it deserves a rewatch. I liked it so much better than Spectre, which I fucking hate. I liked, <laughs> uh, I liked Skyfall. I hated Spectre. And yeah, then I liked it. Uh, yeah. The last, the, the elements of the last one I thought were, were okay. I liked it you better know, it than was, Skyfall, which isn't hard. It, it was weird. Skyfall, uh, Spectre, I'm sorry. The last one, uh, what was No Time to Die? Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was weird because it, it, it wanted to have that that new Bond feel, that groundedness, but it also directly transitioned into silly Bond world with with crazy gadgets yeah. and weirdness. And it wanted to kind of pay homage to both worlds, and it didn't really work out for no, me. No, and, and what it ended up doing was complete was I, I'm not going to say a complete cock up, but it wasn't great. Yeah, it, it, it was a little bit of an awkward exit. Existing in the same world that it did before, and it. it and you also have no idea what to do with the franchise now. Yeah. Well, no, I'll tell you because I read a lot about that. Even though I didn't like that film, the reason they did what they did at the end. Um, can we say? Can we talk about it? We're beyond the spoiler point now. Uh, you know, spoiler <laughs> alert: This movie came out like two years ago. Yeah. So if you so, haven't seen so it yet, when they kill your... James Bond, okay, <laughs> they established they're going to do now every set of Bond films is its own continuity. That's why they wanted to kill him on uh, screen. That's uh... his story's end. So when we multiverse see nonsense eight or whatever, they're going to be three or four films uh, just about that bond. That's it. I don't, I don't think I don't, I don't agree with that as a methodology for the James Bond character. There's no need for it. Um, yeah. But well, no, I, I, I get, I, I get it, but I there, don't. There's agree. a yeah. rabid bond fan yeah. base who goes crazy with like, you have to make sure he's a ninja. Like Sean Connery was a ninja. They just go crazy for that stuff. And they say, no, 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 we're just going to do these films and, all right, we just got to hit the, the, the Zach's withdrawal wave. <laughs> yeah. um, as as happens at this time every week. We have a we decade, gentlemen, to achieve. Let's go okay, for 2010. So, all right, let's do the 2010s, and I think that we might end up calling it after that. And There's not really a willing, whole lot we, to talk we'll about we'll in the see 2020s. Where we go. In the 2020s, we can just kind of scramble through if you want because most of them mm -hmm. suck, and they're kind mm -hmm. of uh, – we're only they're two like, years yeah, they're like they're like they're like you know the pity years. date mentions. So uh, let's... <laughs> I can give you five great films from the 2020s that easily. Mine are oh, not well. great. I well, I have one great and four acceptable. So uh, let let me do a. I was scrambling a little bit. What am I doing? How did I get here? Where am I? Where are my pants? Um, You're 111 years old. <laughs> so Interstellar. There were oh, so many layers to this movie. I think this is one of Matthew McConaughey's probably best roles ever. Um, what about Days and Confused? I've never seen that movie. Yep. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I fucking hate Come it. Come on. So much. Uh, you're, you're, you, you are the son I didn't ask for. So, <laughs> and the end of it brought it all together nicely because there was a lot of confusing weird shit. And I think it actually did tie it together. And... I, and I know it was weird. It I get that, but I still fucking loved it. So it was great. Captain America, the Winter Soldier. This is my favorite of all the Marvel films. Hmm. I understand Iron Man was the most important, but this is my favorite. Um, I like the spy stuff. I like them bringing Bucky yeah. back. There was there was literally no element of this film I didn't like. I thought this was brilliant from start to finish. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. Now, now I'm going to start getting into more controversial shit. Yeah. <laughs> Darkest Hour. 
this is one of my most favorite I can Gary see Oldman roles as um, Winston Churchill. He was so good. I mean, he actually did win an Oscar for this role. And when he delivers the the essential Churchill speech on the floor of the parliament, you believe you're watching Churchill. It is just so well done. So there's two. So you, you can watch Darkest Hour and then Dunkirk at the same time. And you're getting the whole complete story of the, of the battle that took place at that point. Um, so, and then he's on the train, he's talking to the people. So Avengers Infinity War. Um, I think this was just such a well put together movie with 10 billion moving pieces and it didn't get out of control mm -hmm. and it easily could have. It's like you're playing a line on your guitar and it can go off the rails at any second. Yet it hangs on. And that's what this yep. movie does. The sequel, yeah. not so well. Captain Marvel, we can say, fuck off, Captain Marvel. But mm. uh, Endgame, I, I don't think did a very good job with it. And, and Endgame nope. actually has a lot of elements that I don't like. But uh, Chris Evans, oh. who I dislike in the real world, but I like as Captain America. <laughs> I thought he was great. There was this, the, the three big story arcs of, of Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man in this are just so well done. Thor and his most powerful is what you got from this movie as well, which I, this was, I, I, I'm not into dudes, but this was mildly arousing. I'm, I'm just going to say mm. it out loud. So, um, and then this, another one that's, that's not going to be probably popular, but I'm going to talk about it is once upon a time in America. Okay. Oh, okay. This was one of the great guy movies. This was a movie about male friendship and not in like a fucking weird way, but this was a buddy film. Mm -hmm. And the deep bonds that 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 men can form for each other in a, in a normal way, and it's it's just it's a very refreshing kind of film. The Bruce Lee scene I thought was fucking hilarious, also. <laughs> um, but it's just stuff that you you don't necessarily. And Brad Pitt's he, he's a little wonky on the outside, but in this movie he was really really good. And again, it's an alternate history where you get Charlie Manson and all the other stuff. But the last scene in the movie, which is also alternate history, I think is one of the funniest fucking scenes I've ever seen on screen. And when my son and I saw it, it's a very violent scene. Um, we laughed so hard and I felt kind of bad because there were like these older ladies sitting in front of us in the theater. And if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's just, we're the, the one broad's getting her face beaten with a phone, but context, uh, <laughs> they were trying to kill them in the flamethrower scene. It's just fucking hilarious. <laughs> anyway, like I said, it's a little bit odd, but that that's my, that's my end of the 2010s. I've yet to see that one. I think that's, I think that's one of the few Tarantino movies I haven't seen. Yeah, here, here. Like conversely, I hated the Hateful Eight. I thought that was a fucking terrible movie. A lot of people like it. I did not. So funny enough, I'm actually uh, unpopular opinion. Not a big fan of Tarantino, but I have seen that movie. Yeah. So my turn. All right, Matt. Yep. On to you, yep. brother. First, on to Matt. my my Godzilla brother, Dragon Rouge. I told you guys about this last week. I couldn't reach it. <laughs> this is my one foot tall Godzilla for Godzilla Final Wars. Oh, that is nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. Oh, I love me some Godzilla. Yeah. Yeah. So my films here, the first one, th there's a short list of films that are utterly perfect. Like you'll take a magnifying glass and go frame by frame to find flaws <laughs> with these films. Okay. Films like uh, yeah. uh, Citizen Kane, Seven Samurai, yeah. Sons of Ujima, like that. This is an animated film called Songs of the Sea. Okay. It's from a, someplace, a studio called Cartoon Saloon out of Ireland uh, who has a partnership with a with Fran uh, French company. They've done a couple of animated films, three based on Irish folklore and one based on uh, uh, the uh, little girl in the Taliban in the Middle East. Um, this film, it's probably the best visual like movie representation of a little boy grieving for his dead mother you'll ever see set, set to a, set to a Irish folk tale. Wow. I, I mean, there are very that few. I mean, fascinating. This actually gets me emotional when I watch this. Not because my mom died when I was young or anything, but um, like I, when I get to the end of this, and even now I'm almost tearing up talking about it. It's like this movie just draws you in, and 
it, it, it's it's utterly perfect. There's nothing in it you can find like, well, that scene was a little off or that animation. You just can't. It's called Song of the Sea. Okay. Uh, my second film was uh, the birth of a new subgenre of action films. These two guys took everything from movies like Hong Kong action films, the Matrix films, Equilibrium, the John Bourne films, put the good parts together and add some other work to it. It's called you know, John Wick. Yes. I love I love John Wick. John Wick yeah. is such a fun series. Yeah, it's just I, I call it the the full realism action subgenre now. I don't know what other people call it, but it, it, like where you know they're doing superhuman stuff, but the setting is established that all people are like that. They train type of thing, you know. So um, I'm not a huge John Wick fan. I'll admit it. I I appreciate what it is. I respect it. They're fantastic action movies. The, the direction and the attention to detail is amazing and spectacular. I get bored. <laughs> you just I keep running around. How do you get bored with endless <laughs> killing? It's endless <laughs> killing is so good. <laughs> I'm looking for more of a story, and I, I'm not finding it there. It's just he's mad, and he's killing a bunch of people who are trying to kill him. But they get killed him. his puppy. I get that. It's a little empty. <laughs> He killed his dog. <laughs> Don't yeah. kill John Wick's dog. That's the last one. <laughs> Don't kill John, with John Wick's dog. dog. I'm gonna yeah. get revenge for five movies. Yeah. Uh, I know. get it. I get it. <laughs> so, it is. It is cool. I mean, I, I, I like what they do with it. And for some reason, I I can't. I haven't been drawn into. Actually, I love Ron Ian McShane in that so much. I think he is just yeah. so brilliant. I like Ian McShane in almost everything. Though, to be fair, well, I think these two directors in their film said, "Look." We're going to get a bunch of kick-ass actors, give them the general guideline and oh, say, yeah. we're going to actually act. We don't mm. want you to, to just do like, like what they do now, which is like, like, like just read from the script and do, you know, just act like in the old days where they, no one told John Wayne what to do. They just gave him the general idea and said, go do, no, no one told you, you can go to whole movies like that. I think these guys got back to that. Mm -hmm. um, now my next film, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, especially if you can see the black and white version. Um, to people no, who've never seen, seen the Mad Max films, films like, you know, our friend up here, uh, if you watch them, they're not actually sequels. They're stories told in the future after the apocalypse and recovery about one of the big legends of, of characters from the apocalypse and the things he was alleged to do as a legend. That's why he does superhuman stuff in every one of them and all that. He's a legend. It's like, it's like I was telling the legends of Hercules from the ancient days. So if you understand that when you watch these four films, you get a better sense. Because like modern people are going to watch them all in one year, whereas although we've seen them as they came out, so we kind of go into it. Right. It's, a, it's not yep. the same exact character. But this film, I was amazed. I mean, George Romero is a great director, but uh, I was amazed that um, George Miller. I'm sorry, Romero is the uh, big difference. Uh, big difference. Yeah. Zombies yeah. and pig movies. Big difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed that he still had to put this movie together. Um, you know, oh my God! The, 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 he must have spent more time making up the lore for this film than doing the film. You know, and the guy had his own theme band. Oh talk. my God! John, Johnny Skinwalker has a very uh, different view on this. Max was a pussy, and I actually, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, if Max didn't do what he did, they all would have died. Like his superhuman abilities would allow them to live through that film. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's a, I but your take is your take. That's that's yeah. the beauty of all this. Um, so my next film, I didn't even know at the time. I am now a fan of this director because of something that came out this decade. Um, a Denny Villeneuve film called Sicario. I only watched this oh, film. Oh, Sicario is fucking yeah. great. Yeah, I only watched the film because I love all the actors. Ah, it, it can't be that bad. I was thinking, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> they did. They went there. Like like hmm. at the ending of this film. It, it, I mean. They went there. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and the last thing is, I have two kind of slightly flawed horror films that are tied for not five here. Uh, one is called Dark Was the Dark Was the Night. Um, it's I, I watched this film because an actor named Kevin Durand is in here. He's a really good kind of TV level supporting movie level <laughs> actor. He was in a TV show called The Strain. If you remember, have watched that. He oh, the strain the was catcher. really good. Who was he in the strain? He was the rat catcher in the strain. Oh, the rat guy. I like the rat guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's a star of this movie, and the rat it guy. only gets ruined <laughs> because. And I have uh, there's a sort of stinger epilogue at the end after they do the horror movie. If they just edited that out, this would have been like a really, really excellent horror film. As is, it's a really good horror film. And now, the would he have gone that, after Rat Tattooey? 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> speaking of, of exterminators, the, the the last film is a Norwegian film called Troll Hunter. It, yeah. If you've never seen it, uh, you will be surprised. It's, it's, it's a found footage film, but about the ah. the official troll hunter of Norway. <laughs> That's all I have to say. It's, not it's a hoot. Movie. You know, it's just a hoot. And, uh, I mean, there's lots of honorable mentions. I got one honorable mention I have to give. Uh, there's that really kind of bad Conan film from 2011, even though you'd think Jason Momoa was a good actor to play Conan. Yeah. Uh, but the opening to that film with Kid Conan, I watched that every year as a short film, that opening 15 minutes. <laughs> that is the most perfect adaptation of Conan ever, is that when that kid – Played Kid the Conan. Problem is, is the rest of the film? Just cut it out. Just make it cut. And just have it open. That's it's a fifteen-minute movie yeah. with a very I long have a fifteen-minute cut of that in my Plex library. I just watch every. Fair year. enough. Fair yeah. enough. When he walks back with the heads in his hand, and he, I was like, "That's Conan. That's just Conan." <laughs> you know, and I'm uh, and uh, I'm done. Well, you know, so all right. Those those were solid. Some of them weird, which is what we really appreciate. We like yep. the deep dive. All right, John. This Momoa is at his best when he doesn't talk. <laughs> yes, he, so he, says Star Stargate Atlantis. Like Momoa I grunting. agree with this. <laughs> he's fantastic. He, I don't know. I think Jason Momoa has kind of become like the like the Chris <laughs> Hemsworth, where it's like. He's not a bad actor, but it's like if we want people to go see the movie, throw him in there because at least women will go see the movie. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> strapping, oh. I think, is the, the term. He's a strapping man. <laughs> um, okay, so for my 2010 list, I did manage to come up with a, a decent list. Like I said, I think I was really reaching for the 2020s list which i guess apparently we'll get to next week um i have one honorable mention in my 2010 list that might be a little bit unpopular so i'll save that for last um, <laughs> but for the 2010s kind of keeping it in the realm with the comic book venture a little bit uh i think one that was a really important film was logan oh i agree the yep. final, the final Wolverine film yeah. featuring Hugh Jackman. They finally made the character R-rated. He could finally say fuck. There could finally be blood. <laughs> um, but he's old. He's broken down. It had an yeah. elderly Professor X that was kind of in the same realm of things, and it just it it painted this whole different world of these mutants that you thought were invincible and immortal and it's like no it's like maybe they age a little slower but they do age and they do break down oh, uh, when Logan X is losing his when he yeah. loses control and it just fucks up everything that's that's some creepy scary shit Logan probably yeah. should have killed him yeah, yeah. so I, I thought that's, the that's movie the Logan <laughs> the, the movie Logan I thought was a really important movie and that's another one too um talking about like if you watch like the black and white version yeah if you bought the physical copy of logan there on the on the blu-ray there was an option to watch it um uh, in black and white Ooh. i think except for the fact that anytime I, and i could be wrong maybe i should have looked this up but <laughs> i think anytime there was blood there would be red but otherwise the film was oh, all really? there trying to be all noir and black and white i don't remember um, that i thought i did see the black and white version i don't remember the uh, a red bleeding through and, maybe uh, Maybe yeah. maybe I'm just making uh, that part up, but it was it like watching it on all black and white. It it, it puts the film really totally. Good yeah, it was very strange. Um, but then keeping in the realm with the the superhero films, but also the importance of making a character um, R rated. Deadpool. Oh, fucking Deadpool! Yep. The first Deadpool yep. movie. That's really good. They yeah. finally did Deadpool right. Um, <laughs> I. There was like no Ryan, Deadpool before that. I, I like Ryan Reynolds. Um, no. But yeah, what, the, what they did with him in the Wolverine Origins film was atrocious. Yeah. <laughs> it yep. was terrible. Yeah. It was so bad. <laughs> so they the also fact that they at jail least, for that. The fact that they at least like saw fit to bring back the same actor to redeem the same character. I'm like, okay. Um, I have to interject. 
That was all Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. The director of bring him Origins back. Of hates Deadpool as a character. Ryan Reynolds is the one who brought Deadpool back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that, that short that they, they just did, it was almost like their fan version of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Where they worked it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 100% credit for to Ryan Reynolds for that. And thank God they did it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, finally, like a, a proper R rated Deadpool, I think was another really important film and fucking hilarious to begin with. I mean, it was just like, it was funny. It was entertaining. It was violent. It just, it, it was everything you could have expected. And if I could piggyback on that, because uh, I had I had that in my top five as well. <laughs> I, but the the thing that I wanted to mention about it, so I'll piggyback here. Uh, the animation of the costumed eyes and them being entirely white mm-hmm. was so much of an achievement towards the tone of the mm-hmm. film. Yeah, I don't think people can recognize off the bat that. That was such an important decision to make. We never would have gotten that cartoonish delivery if we didn't see his eyes moving. Yeah, I mean, they do it now mechanically with Spider-Man, but they should have been doing it the whole time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, just that alone to me, uh, it's uh, it's so good to see his stupid face beneath that <laughs> costume <laughs> you can yeah. read every single joke that he tells just by his yes. eye movements it's so good yeah yeah so i think my my next two i can just sort of like rapid fire through two because they um they sort of go together but spoiler alert more nolan movies uh inception and interstellar uh both great movies both Big time mind fucks that, uh, as we've talked at great lengths already, Christopher Nolan makes his movies for rewatchability. Uh, whether you saw the twist coming or not, whatever, like there's just something about at the end of a Christopher Nolan movie, you kind of want to watch it again. And I yep. think Inception and Interstellar were both perfect examples of that. Interstellar, maybe a little bit harder because it's a longer movie, but it was a fantastic movie. I mean, the performance of Matthew McConaughey the whole relationship between the, the father and his kids and the grandfather and everything like it just mm-hmm. it was such a great movie interstellar uh, a, a little of, bit I longer mean, the cast that was the cast in that was fucking stellar he had a lot yeah. of good good actors and that so good lithgow. yeah john lithgow michael kane but it's just it's a longer movie so the rewatchability might drop a little bit but you still want to rewatch it because the story was so good um uh, now is where I probably get into maybe a little bit of the unpopular opinions because this sort of caused a a rift in the the MCU. But I don't know. I I for my personal you say choice, Captain I threw Marvel. It. I'm, I'm cutting you out. Well, it's been good talking to everybody. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> no, I threw in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, no, that's not a bad great. choice. There were there no, were a lot totally of. Tough. There were a lot of really great Marvel movies for a lot of different really great reasons, but I thought Guardians of the Galaxy was um, it was a good and a bad because it was a great movie and introduced these characters, great story, great soundtrack, great everything. The bad of it is that because of the success of Guardians of the Galaxy, everyone in the movie studio decided, okay, that's the new format. Thor has to be funny and have punchlines. Okay, now every other Marvel movie has to be funny and have punchlines. And so like that, that became the format. Mm. With Guardians, it worked. The the soundtrack, because uh Quill's mom gave him the 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 tape with the songs, and he was listening to those songs because his mom gave them to him. The the music worked in the soundtrack because it was part of the story. Once mm-hmm. they introduced modern music into the soundtrack of like Thor Ragnarok, it didn't fit because it, it wasn't part of the story. It was just, oh, we're going to use this Led Zeppelin song on the soundtrack because now we think it'll be cool and it'll be, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. So it was right. sort of like this double edged sword of like the movie itself was great. I mean, Chris Pratt was awesome. Dave Bautista's Drax, everything like uh, the, the whole the cast. What about crew, the Diesel? story? Every the <laughs> funny fact about that is they actually uh, typically when they release movies in other countries, they you know dub the actors over in their different languages. They actually had Vin Diesel say all the different inflections of I am Groot <laughs> in all the different languages. So 
<laughs> Groot is the only character in the movie that in all the different countries it's still Vin Diesel. <laughs> he, he could be saying, I'm going to kill you with a teacup with every line. <laughs> Hysterical. Um, but so anyways, I think that was, it was a good and an important movie, but at the same time, I think it caused an unfortunate shift in the MCU and that all of a sudden it became yeah, the ripple effect. Ev- a- a- every mm-hmm. movie had to be this funny, quippy punchline modern top 40, pop music, top 40 yeah. music yeah it yeah but i thought that the the original movie itself i thought was great and then of course my my honorable honorable mention unpopular opinion i still very much enjoyed the hobbit trilogy it still had the peter jackson vibe to it i know it went way off the rails from the book i've read the book many times i still thought the movies were enjoyable and i can count them as one movie but my aunt- yeah, well, you know that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And I stand by that. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> you gave me that clip. <laughs> that's like totally your opinion, man. <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Yo. Hey, uh, before we move on, I do want to say welcome to Mister A W K, my hey, brother Andrew, what's over up? in the UK. Where it's the middle of the night right now, so he's pulling an all nighter. So thanks for being here. Cheers. All right, <clears throat> Stephen, you have any? I, I know we ran kind of through your your listing. Do you have some other stuff that you want to talk about, though? I no, I have a uh, I have a 2010 list. I updated. Oh, you, oh, I, I somehow I you don't have to forget. I wish the extra for mile my and uh, misunderstanding and of literally everything working under pressure. <laughs> because uh, well, I, am I have the three times so. <laughs> so I do have a top five for 2010, and uh, I'm very proud to mention that only one of them uh, was mentioned by somebody else so far. So <laughs> right, here we go. go. Um, we have the uh, two of them by our uh, Dune director. I'm not even going to attempt to remember his name, much less pronounce it. Um, but uh, we all know who he is at this point, uh, I think. Uh no, yeah, the dude. Denny Yes, Dillon. yes there we go. Thank you. Um, you those, two films, <laughs> those two films are Gravity and The Arrival, oh. or Arrival. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have clips for both, but it's not necessarily important. But the technical achievements on both of them are uh, far beyond just the visual qualities that he presents. Um, The scattering of debris and the claustrophobic feel of isolation in space is way beyond. Did you add that to the other list, Stephen? I'm sorry? Did you add that to the other list? Um, It's uh, it's in the same group chat. Yeah, I got it. It's just a little further down. Well, you got it? Okay. Yeah, I got it. Go ahead and share my screen. Let me add it because I kind of, I went off. And did Thanks again, Brandon, now. for producing. Yeah. Yeah. Moron. <laughs> so this scene uh, is depicting her finally getting to safety for the first time, and she is suffocating while this whole sequence is going down. Meanwhile, she has the wherewithal to lock the door, turn on the pressure recycler, bring air into the lock, and then disassemble her spacesuit while suffocating. Meanwhile, the actress is not entirely in a spacesuit. She's sitting on a, a basically a robotic arm during filming. And the majority of the set is not even visible to the actress during this whole sequence. I mean, that alone. And then the final solution, uh, the final uh, resolution of her character in this sequence falling into an in utero position with the tubes just draping down by accident is an absolute magical moment for the themes of this film. Just absolutely delightful to watch happen on screen. This is out of context for anybody who hasn't seen it, but this moment right here really, really sets up what the film is trying to talk about. It's just absolutely gorgeous cinematography and a tribute to the director himself. And I'm going to admit, I didn't hate George Clooney in this. Yeah, he plays George Clooney in this, basically. <laughs> well, he always does. But I didn't hate, I usually hate George Clooney. I did not hate him in this. I thought he was good in this. <laughs> yeah, and no, it all. He didn't have to die because there are scientific inaccuracies in this film, which is why I don't like it. 
Um, he did and, uh, die, so that was a good thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Moving on to the next one, which I de- I also have a, a, a sequence clip for. Yeah. Um, Go ahead and load it. Which which one is it? I actually think I have the um, arrival. It's, uh, yeah, arrival. Or do you already have that pulled up, Matt? Or, uh, I've Brandon? got it for you. Okay, because thank you, Brandon. I'm an ass. No, it's all right. <laughs> so this sequence um, basically shows what this movie is really all about, and that is, if aliens were to arrive here. How oh, yeah. the hell would you even communicate with these guys? Yep. I mean, I'm not even yep. going to bring up the depiction of these aliens themselves, which is beyond the pale. I mean, good yes. grief. And I, it's we've nice never because seen... it's, it's not standard carbon-based life form stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's these nice. aliens are so alien. I mean, the great language, forest, so great. Just so fantastic. But her laying out just this proposal of how do we even know how to what is the definition of the word purpose? I mean, I'm a huge advocate for the 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 definition of words and the efficacy of the etymology of words in our language, Um, something that they've been just tearing apart the last five years. It's been infuriating. Language is all we have next to law that keeps the whole civilization in check. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that anymore. And uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we've got all these contradictory words. So, uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, Deadpool, and I've already piggybacked my reasons for that. But the next film on my list is uh, one by the same guy who did um, uh, District Nine. Oh, uh, yeah. a movie, a movie I, actually, called I can pull Chappie. that one up. I can pull that one up. <laughs> I've got it for you if you want. Or here. Oh, I got to get through the Shoot. beer commercial first. Yeah, no worries. Okay, beer commercial. I have over. no commercials. I pay the price. <laughs> oh, you're a daredevil, dude. <laughs> Ninja so, and Yolandi. It, what everybody needs to recognize when they're watching this film, if they haven't seen it, certainly while watching this clip, is there are no robots on screen. There are some props that the actors deal with, but all of the moving robots are mocap and CGI Mm -hmm. implanted into the feature. And Mm -hmm. let me tell you something. During the course of this film, the character Chappie leads you to believe that it is conscious, that it is a being with intention and drive. It's really quite miraculous. (laughs) Well, Even. he did that same thing with District 9, and he did such a yeah, good he job did. of that. Mm-hmm. I love District 9 quite a bit. Actually. And the depiction of mechs on screen mm. is something that Japan was probably so happy to see. I mean, this is a live-action depiction of robots in combat. It's so good. And that's why we now have killer robot dogs. Thank you, Chappie. <laughs> it's almost a, 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 a timber wolf from Battletech that he's fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's su- it's such a great achievement for film. And uh, last on my list is the only girl in cinema during 2010s that deserves any respect. I can't believe that this oh, film God. was completely overlooked. And that is Go ahead and share Alita it. Battle Angel. Yeah. That was good. I this depiction. Like this it was surprisingly every time really I, good. I watched this trailer on loop for like two weeks and it just continuously brought me to the most happy warm tears because I couldn't believe that they were executing this, that this was something that they were able to achieve and able to achieve it believably. I mean, this is James Cameron. Uh, This is what an anime droid would look like on screen. Our good friend Chris, Christoph Waltz again. Yeah, and dad. he was fantastic. He was so perfect he was for so the role. Good in this. There, you know what? He, this is another one of those movies where you didn't really, you didn't really have the wasted characters, and the bad guys in it were great. Yeah, yeah. Robert yeah. Rodriguez, he did it right. This is the last thing he did right. I like that they made the <laughs> Uncanny Valley work for them, and as opposed to against them. Yeah, yeah, because she's supposed to be uncanny. Exactly. I, I didn't love that it was a, you know, an unfinished story though. It, it definitely. Yeah, I agree. You know, and uh, they did the, the same story. thing with uh, 
the uh, the Golden Compass was a very very yeah. strong disappointment yeah. that they didn't continue with that miraculous piece of cinema. So yeah, but yeah. this movie actually made money, and they should have made a sequel. <laughs> I think I think politics is what killed the sequel. Yeah, yeah. But mm. considering, I mean, I've watched the anime for years. Oh, yeah. And this Anime is classic, such a strong classic, duplication. Yeah. 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 And talk about think, an excellent adaptation. No surprise coming from the man who gave us Sin City. Yeah. yeah. True. From a, from a consumer point of view, though, it should have been a standalone, uh, you know, start to finish story that could Yeah, be they could have cleaned up the ending. Story. Yeah. They could have cleaned up the ending so that it didn't yeah. feel so precedent to have it, have a sequel. But yeah. yeah. And that's well, my top Cameron five. intended to do more movies. They just never funded it. Yeah. Yep. Well, he probably gambled it so that he could get his money for Avatar. Fucking Avatar. Mm. Which I have never liked those films. Whatever. Yeah. They're still an achievement. They're still a historical <laughs> benchmark I, for yeah. cinema. I, you know, yeah, there's no getting around. Yeah, yeah. The, I like the, watch the Avatar with the sound off because that script is horrible. But it's a beautiful thing to watch. <laughs> it is you a beautiful thing to watch. For unobtainium, dude. Um, <laughs> oh, I, don't off name. With your unobtainium. I don't think his <laughs> Avatar films are as impressive as his film The Abyss from a technical point of view. Oh, that the work Abyss was, was so amazing. Good. The Abyss was a yeah. brilliant movie. Yeah. And you got yeah. Michael Bean in that, who I love in pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. All right, Brandon, you are up. Oh, well, I've got pictures to share again, but uh, this decade is a little different. You know, having okay. kids and all that, but uh, I really, out of all the Marvel movies, Marvel took risks. They took a huge risk with Guardians of the Galaxy. Who, That's other true. than the Uber nerds, knew who the hell they were? They were, you know, F class, D class superheroes. They got elevated up to A class status. And of course, Chris Pratt is just badass all the way around. I absolutely yeah. adore. Guardians of the Galaxy and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. They yep. play together as a great, a great one-two combo for the movies. While you know the second one may not be as good, it's still damn good. I love both yeah. of them. Yeah, the idea that they made us love a raccoon and a tree is just beyond <laughs> imagination. That alone <laughs> puts it into legendary category. It's like, Jesus Absolutely. Christ, it's a raccoon and a tree. Mm -hmm. How did they make that work? It's just so good. <laughs> yeah. I love that first movie. Second one, I got a lot of issues with. Well, Ego, the you know, Ego's not the best villain, but Kurt Russell is just awesome. You can't, <laughs> I, I love Kurt Russell. The, their now, version of Eagle is actually better to me than the comic book version. Hmm. Now moving, moving on to the next one. When you think of uh, you know CGI movies and how good they were, at this point we have Pixar and we have uh, uh, DreamWorks. Well, Comcast or Universal at the time thought, hmm, let's dive into it. And what did they create? Despicable Me. One, yeah. two, and three by Illumination. Those guys fun. are bloody flam fantastic. They're so good. All three of the movies are some of my favorite from this time. And my I've got all of them on Blu-ray. Watched them upwards, downwards, backwards, forwards, everything. Just the story of the bad guy who's trying to win at being the bad guy, who no longer is really winning, comes up with a grand fantastical scheme. And at the end of the day, ends up with not a heart of gold, but a heart of bronze. He turns away from his villainy and decides to become a father. So the first one, and of course the second one with uh, getting, you know, obtaining the wife and leveling up, and then the third one leveling up yet again with his brother <laughs> and learning the family business, which indeed was villainy. <laughs> They're great movies, and as I said, Illumination. They hit the jackpot with the minions. They mm -hmm. right now, if you go to Universal, you are flooded with everything minions and despicable me. Yep. Not to be outdone within this decade is one movie from Pixar. And I only choose one because most of the other ones are nowhere near as good as this. And it's a heartbreaking story. It really is. 
It's Toy Story 3. The story of losing your master, growing up, going to college, going to a daycare, being abused, yep. and eventually turning into an escape movie. Hmm. Perfect, the perfect bear, pacing. When the girl loses the bear. And yep. all the music that, or, or not the bear, I'm sorry, um, the girl, the girl, uh, or was the second movie? I might be, I may be confusing my Toy Story movies. You know what I think I am? Just ignore everything ignore. I just said, literally. I'm going to back yeah. up. Now. Everything about this movie is, is top notch. This was, this should have been and should have remained the magnum opus for Toy Story. Because other mm -hmm. than the original two yeah. and all of their yeah. technical and storytelling prestige yep. and prowess since this movie nothing else has come close and ever since john lasseter got the boot for absolute horseshit reasons that studio yeah. has just become abject trash yeah i agree so no this I, was I a perfect the ending, ending for it. i'll admit it i i shed some tears at the end <clears throat> i think we all did when andy um, was giving his toys to the girl mm -hmm. and, was, yep. and that was the perfect ending that was the perfect ending. Yeah. And they, yep, yeah, they had was. to freaking ruin it with Toy Story 4. Yeah. Which had when moments you go that beyond. were fine, but the problem was it ends up being, it's not nearly as satisfying as the end of Toy Story 3. Where okay, Andy yeah, well, you know and you know that you know the toys are going to, you know, continue to have relevance. When, once you go beyond a trilogy, like, I, I feel like 3 is a good number. Like, yeah. You you make movies like you make a one two three you can kind of round out your story. It's like a trilogy is like a solid way to to end out a franchise. Once you go beyond that, it's like well now you're just reaching a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, if but you yeah. got a Toy series Story. planned, you can do it. Yeah. If you got an arc planned, then that ends. <laughs> and that's, yeah. That's kind of it. So yeah, well, Toy Story three, one of the best from the start of the decade. Now. The next one has been mentioned, and I count both movies in it. <coughs> Wait. Hold on. I got... Uh, there we go. Deadpool and Deadpool 2. And why? Because it showed that you can do an R-rated Marvel movie, and Ryan Reynolds is a freaking genius. Period. Yes. That Yay. demo reel that he put together showed what they could do on a budget, and holy shit, this was the highest, ra you know, the highest grossing rated R movie up until joker mm. and it's absolutely fantastic and all i have to say for the second movie besides uh him coming out at the end of the first one saying yeah why are you still here it's time to go home we are going to do a second movie and we're going to have cable <laughs> and at the very beginning blowing himself up putting his finger up and saying Fuck Wolverine. <laughs> if he can die in a movie, I can die in a movie too. Oh, interesting. You've got, you got the Super Duper Cut logo up there. Oh, yes. I was not a fan of and It show, It kind of showed what editing can really do for a movie. It exemplified that because I think the Super Duper it, Cut did a lot of things that weren't as good as the, the theatrical release. It's not always like better. Yeah. I, I like them both. Weird uh, it's just this is um, just the one that I found, but yeah, both I, of I them saw them, saw them in theaters, got copies of them, got the extended <clears throat> cuts of them. Oh, Don't both, see the PG thirteen Fred Savage cut. That is horse shit. <laughs> yeah. So the reason and then Cable and Domino in here. Um, there's if you ever yep. want to read a comic book series where I haven't read a lot of continuity from Marvel, Fabian Nietzsche's Cable Deadpool series. The first <laughs> 50 issues, I guess, or so of it is kind of it, it, you can just go by the like I said, it's you'll enjoy it even if you're not a comic book fan. Fabian Yates is the one guy, only guy, should be allowed to write Deadpool in the comics. Yes, yeah, Deadpool is Deadpool is Deadpool, and he's he's just so much fun. And Ryan Reynolds just hams it up completely, and it works. Yep, and yep, then of course. Yep, yep. You have to have the Winter Soldier because out of out of, with the with maybe the exception of uh, of Infinity Wars, which I did not see in the theater. Captain America, the Winter Soldier was the last one that I did see in the theater that was worth a damn overall story. The stakes, everything of this movie was peak. 
This is before they started. It started to introduce all of the wokey elements, starting to work in some of the stupider shit that they eventually started doing. To me, as a standalone story, it's perfect. As tied into the MCU, it's it help. It, this helps make things way better going forward with it. And then I have an honorable mention. It's one of my favorite series from the '90s that we never talked about, or at least I don't remember talking about it. But this one is my favorite of the tr- of the trilogy, The Men in Black. We oh, are really? them. We are they. Huh. We are the men in black. And I love, I love the story of going back in time, meeting Kay when he was younger. And of course, Josh Brolin is perfect huh. in the whole thing. And he Tommy Lee Jones is great. great. Tommy Lee. Yeah, back before Will Smith turned into a complete and total wussy. <laughs> the, the story of it and and everything about it, it's one of the few times where time travel really worked. They didn't they they did it, they did it as cleanly as possible. You know, they it just works. As a movie, it's great. And compared to the other two movies, it it did better in theaters. Even with adjusted for inflation, it still did better than the first two. And I absolutely freaking love the first one. That one that one showed the first one showed what you could do with CGI. It took those extra steps. The second one was a step back in the story. This one rectified all of it. So I just remember to, to tip your waitress. <laughs> yeah, my one of my favorite characters in that in that sequence is that poor agent stuck in the 60s, like uh, Andy Warhol hmm. sequence. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! <laughs> it just gives you this teensy weensy glimpse into like how insane it must have been to be an agent back in that time period. It's just like, <laughs> I mean, he's in a party where you can't tell are any of are all of these people aliens? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, when you when you think about uh, Andy Warhol and who he hung out with and all that, it it wouldn't surprise me, and that's what made it so damn funny. Is when he comes yeah. out and says, "This is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Why the hell do I have to keep doing this? Keeping up this stupid appearance with these stupid paintings? Look, I painted a can of soup. <laughs> <laughs> Only an alien would pay buco amounts of bucks for something as stupid as that." <laughs> that I love Andy yeah. Warhol. I take it all back. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, not to speak of the real Andy Warhol, but him placing him into that universe in kind of the same way that uh, uh, Tesla is added to the prestige universe. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God, it, they've just taken this historical character and put him into this cartoon universe. I love when film does that because, <laughs> you know, now that we do have a, an understanding of multiverses. It would be in a parallel universe. Andy Warhol would be a part of the men in black universe in much the same way that, you know, Michael Jackson would be begging to be a men in black, you know, the same thing. It's hmm. I can do it, man. I can do it. Can. <laughs> yeah, please, please Call please me Agent me. M. <laughs> no, you're being ignorant. You're being ignorant. And just remember, this is Wiggy Yang and Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Jamona. Oh, I love the Men in Black. It, it really is. It's fun. So Solid. Men in Black Three, great honorable mention. So I need to add that to my list of films I haven't watched as well. <clears throat> so, Mark. um, and oh. I think we're gonna close it out after this one, guys. Uh, we yep. were hitting a two-hour mark, so it's probably a good place to end it after this. So I'll throw it out there again. If you're willing to come back next hmm. week. We might actually just hit, you know, with opener and the 2020s. And yeah, that won't, huh? well, that won't take long. That won't take time travel and do the 2030s and the 2040s. You know? <laughs> <laughs> time to do some research. Yeah, yeah there's not much yeah. to talk about in the. When Thor 17 comes out in 2042, we're gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> what was it in? What was it in like Back to the Future 2 when he was in the future and it was there was like an ad for like Jaws 30 or something yeah. like that? <laughs> in 3D. <laughs> Lord. So 
up to you guys. Nope. If you want to, if you want to finish it out this week, we can. If you want to close it out next week properly, we can do that. Yeah, let's do it next week. Yeah. I think Matt's top five would be a good way to close it out. Marks. Yep. Marks. Yes. Mark. Yes. Right, Mark. <laughs> let's do All it. Right. Let's see what you got. Let's dive into it. Bring it in, uh, buddy. <laughs> um. I, I, I added one while we were talking, so I've got six now. But uh, most of them have been talked about already. The, the, my first three are ones that have been talked about a lot. Uh, Logan, definitely. I love the old man Logan. I love the black and white version. I think doing a, a noir release of it was, was spectacular. Deadpool. Deadpool 1 and 2 really should be there. But I love Deadpool. Deadpool's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Winter Soldier, for the same reason you guys all love it. I love it as well. Then I'll get into the last three, which were ones that weren't talked about. Uh, one of the um, animated masterpieces of 2010, Into the Spider-Verse. Oh. I think that was a fantastic movie. Yep. I actually Excellent enjoyed mention. Into the Spider-Verse a lot. Yeah. Ooh, okay. I, like, I like seeing the introduction of, of Spider-Gwen. And, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. And uh, I think what they did with the animation and the, the weird animation timing and the shifts in the timing in that uh, from a directorial point of view was really was really cool. Yep. Um, then I've, I've got Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Solid. And, you know, it's it's another movie with with music. And uh, I, I love the portrayal of music and musicians. In movies having done that for so long and being relatable to me of just playing crappy punk music <laughs> and just getting out there and doing it and then the movie was just fun all of its video game references garbage truck was stuff. a great song and you can't tell me otherwise <laughs> which song <laughs> garbage truck <laughs> I love that. I all love the that sex, whole soundtrack. all the sex ba bomb songs were really funny <laughs> I love that whole soundtrack it, were, it was fun. Uh, Actually, own that soundtrack. One, I'm admitting it freely. My 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 honorable mention, which is one I was, was uh, kind of on the fence about, but I, I thought I'd put it in there anyway just to see where you guys were sitting with this because I'm curious. Was uh, Rogue One, the Star Wars? I love show. it. Yes. I like Rogue One. I like Rogue One a lot. Yeah. Um, it has the best. I what I'm not looking forward Final to is Andor because movie. he's he's dead. But I loved I loved Rogue One. Yeah, I actually yeah, I really, really I had well. that on my list at one point as well, but as I was trying to kind of whittle it down and keep things short, I ended up cutting that one out. But yeah, in terms of recent Star Wars movies, that one was a solid film. Yep. Well, no, Rogue yeah, One started development under Lucas. It literally started development. It was one of his projects, so it uh, wasn't like a Disneyification uh, or something, you know? which probably explains an awful lot with yeah. that film. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And it, Interesting. And it fit into a nice little slot, and like when she goes. Thousands of whatever has died for these plans. Well, it we actually, saw it. yeah, yeah, it worked yeah. in context of the other Star Wars movies mm. where I thought the prequels did not, yeah, and the sequels were just shit. But we won't we won't get into that because that's a seventeen hour conversation. <laughs> hey, there's something I, I do want to share with you guys though that Salty uh, came up with while while we were talking. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> oh God. Is there audio? <laughs> oh, I don't I remember that original. There's no audio. need for audio. Oh. No, yeah. I don't know how to share the audio. You got to click the share system audio button. Oh, sweet. <laughs> oh, my Lord. gosh. We'll have to talk it's about amazing. that some other time, but mostly it just covers that. So, oh, that's <laughs> so good. <laughs> anyway. I, thank you, I wanted salty. to bring it back to uh, to Scott Pilgrim for a second. Uh, oh, fuck, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually completely spaced that movie, and I would have added it to mine, but I'm glad I didn't because Mark has a unique mention of his own, which is always <laughs> great for these types of shows. Um, that has got to be one of the cleanest adaptations of a manga ever achieved on film. I mean, yes. Spideyverse, Into sure. the Spider-Verse is an animated feature film, so it, 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 it's on the fence. But Scott Pilgrim is a live action cartoon. Yeah. I mean, the only thing missing is the pow, ka chunk, kablam, powsers, uh, you know, like the 60s there. Batman. It, it, it breaks 
the wall of live action by slipping into an animated feature uh, in much the same way that uh, Speed Racer does. It does mm-hmm. the same things. You've got the streak lines. You've got the over-energized anime feel of like hyper movement and hyper intention. It's such a well-executed property. And I'm so glad they didn't follow it up with some bogus sequel too. Thank it's... God. Yeah. Thank God. No, it doesn't need a sequel. It's standalone. Yeah. Seven yep. evil All by itself. Vegan powers. There was a lot <laughs> of good stuff in this movie. Oh yeah, and it's like it slips in and out of like it did that one sequence where he takes on the vegan superpower guy, and then it goes into full noir mode where it's just the shadows of them in the sequence where like you only see the silhouettes of the two characters. Yeah, those There's kinds a, of pieces of imagery are like almost lost in cinema these days. Well, it's a brilliant match for uh, for Edgar Wright's style of filmmaking to match that with that type of storytelling of the, the manga anime stuff. And, and you get a clear depiction of all of their superpowers. Yeah. Love that movie. Yep. Everybody that I've ever seen react to it. And that's, that's a full spectrum from teenagers all the way up to our age. Yeah. They all love it. They're all tickled by it. They understand all the tropes in it. They understand all of the devices and the references. I mean, even now, it's like a decade later. It's it's still a very powerful piece of cinema. And uh, it talks to an audience that is just starving to death for stuff like this. You, you couldn't possibly recognize all the references in that. There's, there's way too many. Yeah, well, no, that's it, the great part. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> now, I saw two reactors, and literally the preamble was, oh, you're going to love this because you're so into 8-bit you know, video gaming. <laughs> and the other guy was like, oh, I hope it lives up to that, that, that hype. And it did. The guy was like openly admitted at yeah. the end of the review. It lived up to all of the 8-bit hype. Yeah. All right. That is a pretty nice wrap-up. I have so, one bit of trivia for you guys. You all, almost all of you mentioned indirectly when you were talking about your 1990s and 2000 films, but didn't probably didn't know about it. So <laughs> you all talked about, not all, most of you talked about like how uh, there was a big ch- revolution in CGI graphics in late 1990s and 2000s. So you might wonder where did that come from? So prior to about 1995, to do to render like one bit of say something like Jurassic Park. You had to spend like a month in this giant mainframe factory uh, with mm-hmm. like more computing power, than, <clears throat> like a million dollars of computing power to do like one minute, right? Mm-hmm. So some some people wrote a program called Lightwave 3D, which no one wanted to use but would run on like a real desktop computer until JMS doing Babylon 5 said, hey, let's give that a shot Ooh, to do the Babylon, Babylon 5 special effects. And it worked so well c- compared to spending tw- $20 million to render one minute on a giant uh, mainframe farm that it led to everything we have today with all the desktop <laughs> rendering and desktop computing and people doing stuff like this and, or deep fakes and whatever that all came from the success of lightwave 3d and Babylon five. Those are running nice. on a computers. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. I worked, I kind of worked in that area. Like I would not so much um 3d special effects, more like simulating nuclear missile strikes on mainframes and, that's a very. I did some. I I, I was a consultant. It was it's legal stuff. But I did some. <laughs> consultant. My one of my uh, fraternity brothers was working for the government to do some stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that mainframe time was expensive, and people complained if anyone else used it. And to invent lightwave 3D, where you can get a reasonably powerful desktop and simulate yep. a space battle, and then that led to Adobe Premiere Pro and to everything else we're using, Blender and handbrake and all these other programs yeah yeah i remember the first promo discs for lightwave way back in the day i mean when they were still sending out floppies they were (laughs) desperately trying to get people to use it and no one would until jms well people use it but no one big enough use it right the jms to babylon 5 and took off and a deep Mm. dive with matt nice You're, you're just a wellspring of knowledge um, and of course, and I haven't seen any movies. Apparently, that's what we've gained from tonight's <laughs> knowledge. Uh, so, 
are you guys uh, up for next week? I'd yeah, up. I'm up for so. a shorty. Yeah, because it'll probably Hello. be. It'll, <laughs> oh, oh my! Yeah, because it'll, it'll definitely be shorter than this. <laughs> and depending on what happens, we'll see what our our intro stories are. So. Thank you. Uh, it, so let's let's go around the horn for wrap up and what you guys got going on right now. So uh, Matt, unbearable seventy three. What do you got going on right now? Uh, I gotta do my season wrap up for the Orville season three video. Hopefully, get that tomorrow. I'm also, I guess, we do this when we get older. We're back and we reading a lot of books I read when I was younger. This is an underappreciated fantasy author, Patricia A. McKillop. Um, so this is this is actually her most well known book, The Forgotten Beast of Eld. But my favorite thing about her is something called the Riddle Master trilogy. Um, I'm gonna do a I'm gonna do a book review on this. Um, she, more people should read our stuff because she's one of the grand masters of fantasy. Uh, plus, yeah, I got I some other you know comic book. I can tell the Hawk the Slayer if you want to get around to that, and you know get back get back to Stranger Things finally and keep catching up on it. You know, Which and some commentary about, about uh, you know <laughs> the coming abomination on September seventh, that second September second. It's coming. We all know it's coming. Like All those right, giant Tom, the blue collar guy. Movie, what do you, you got know? going on? Well, you know, we're doing our uh, mixtape Mondays thing every Monday on the Creative Blue Collar Guy channel, a regular thing here on Thursdays, and then just my uh, random videos throughout the week. Your, your, your Metallica video was so good. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Stranger Things fans have discovered the band Metallica because Master <laughs> of Puppets was featured in an episode, and now those young Stranger Things fans want to cancel Metallica. <laughs> okay. I've just uh, got a few words for anything. them. Just a few words. They can go fuck themselves. There, I said exactly. it. Exactly. Master that's of more, Puppets is a masterpiece. Period. That's, that's that's more or less what I said in the video. It's it's on my channel, the Creative Blue Collar Guy on YouTube, where it's like. It, People are digging up shit from the 80s saying, oh, they're walking around. I don't want to say it because we'll get kicked off of YouTube, but they're, oh, they were walking around on stage <laughs> doing the salute and the whatever. And it's it's a bad salute. It's not anything that anyone should do. And it upsets people, understandably. <sighs> but I still don't buy it. I think it was out of context. I don't think pe- it, it's... It, it was the 80s. It, it just, <laughs> no, it, it's it's not what people think it was. It's like yeah. the, the bass player, were, Jason uh, Newstead, yeah. who's not even in the band anymore, uh he was like pointing at someone in the crowd but when you're holding a guitar pick you tend to kind of point with your whole hand instead of just a single finger <laughs> anyways it's neither here nor there uh Indeed. so there's that that's fun fair enough all right rant for the day <laughs> <laughs> yep all right steven well i just wanted to say uh, i don't have anything really going on other than my usual cheerleading and chatting and such like that but With that said, I wanted to thank everybody that came down to the chat. Smash that like button on the way out the door. Uh, We got a couple of people I've never seen before around, and uh, welcome. Yeah. Right on, right on. Brandon, the anime guy. Well, tomorrow I'm doing a special live broadcast at 12 p.m. Eastern time since I wasn't able to do one earlier in the week. So I'm going to continue my... uh, my diving into the, uh, the, the the genre of harems within anime. And holy shit, you want to talk about a rabbit hole? That's oh a rabbit hole. Whew. And then for real. this Saturday, 12 p.m. Eastern, Anime 101, I am going to be welcoming my guests, Pablo and Diego of Midnight's Edge and Espanol, because they are my anime senseis. And they are returning right. to the channel. So, Right on. Yep, we're going to be talking some some really good deep dive harems for them because with where they live, the Japanese culture basically is the culture in their countries. The largest the largest concentration of Japanese outside of Japan live in the two countries that they live in. Nice, I've heard that. Wow. Yeah, so it's going to be actually, I take it back. It's not going to be at 12. We're doing an hour and a half show, which means we're going to be starting a half hour earlier, so 11.30 a.m. on Saturday, and I'll have the card up for it, I think, tonight. So once you see it, set your reminders, right and we'll cool. see you Saturday. Excellent. We'll see you tomorrow, too. Yeah. So, Mark. Hey. What's happening? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start by uh, plugging a game that I haven't talked about for a while. 
I believe I'm still writing for a game called By Sweet Carol, uh, which is a really cool uh, game that's being produced over in Europe. It's sort of an adventure action game. It features uh, some really sweet uh, animation, sort of in the style of old Disney's. And we're talking back in the Snow White, um, Cinderella days, that style. But it contains... Um, it's it's kind of a horror element story, so it's combining that sort of Disney animation with modern horror st storytelling. It should be co pretty cool. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I've talked to the guy, but the stuff is in, in early production. Uh, I'm still running the Kickstarter for the Nick Bounty game that's going on over at Kickstarter. It's uh, Nick Bounty and the Goat and the Great Fedora. It's doing relatively well. So well, that's going to run till the end of the month, and hope. Uh, Keep it going. All right on. Well, thank you to everyone on the panel tonight. This was, again, a lot of fun. Um, and apparently we can talk for a very long time about this stuff. Um, but that's probably go nervous. for another two hours. If that's we what we to. do. We, yeah, we could easily go for another two hours. <laughs> um, but we're not going to. We're going we're gonna to cut there. So I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in tonight, everybody in the chat. And especially my panel members uh, for being here tonight. This was a good time. And we'll be doing this again next week covering 2020s. <laughs> and that's that's got to be weird because it almost, I don't even know how it's not weird, frankly. So tune in for that next Thursday, 5 p.m. And uh, I'll be on with John on Monday. Are we doing four or five this week, John? Let's shoot for five, but I don't know what we're talking about yet. <laughs> I rarely know what we're talking about, so that's pretty good. You usually and, don't know uh, what we're talking about as we're talking about it, but you're old. Because I'm 111 years old. We're just going to go with that. <laughs> so, again, thank you to everybody for tuning in tonight, and we will see you later. <laughs>